uh, with um, uh, you know, a DVD or something like that. So sorry for the technical delay. Some of the technical uh, issues that we had here just a few minutes ago and setting up uh, our computers with uh, YouTube. But, um, you know, we've got it kind of worked out now. The stream is working. For some reason, like I said, they wouldn't let us do the uh, live event that we normally had scheduled for. It. So <laughs> we'll figure it all out. This is our first time. Bear with us a little bit, but because uh, we're running a very complicated, a little bit more professional program here. So I'm going to go into a little bit more depth tonight into the class. Huh? Oh, wait. No, I'm sorry. You see you me go. okay? Yeah. You're is everyone seeing us okay? You can uh, frozen, answer in the back. Frozen. Okay. okay so I'm going to go into a little bit more um, depth into this and and uh, we'll have a lot of fun. You can ask Jessica questions along the, uh, as we go. Jessica is going to be right over there monitoring the questions. You can hear her. She'll read questions out to me as um, as we are uh, as we're doing this and I'll be checking it here on our control panel here also to make sure we got it. We'll figure it out. This is a nice test for us all as we get going. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over to we have what we call a down shot. And uh, I'll move over here to our down shot here. Here we go. And uh, we'll get that all worked out. The, um, yeah. If the if it's freezing on them repeatedly, I have them check the resolution. Okay. Jessica said also on your player, um, and it's right down there at the bottom, there is a little wheel. And that wheel that's uh, there is face, in YouTube here, they have all different kinds of qualities that you can control. We're streaming to you in very high quality 1080p, um, but how much you can receive will be a little bit different. So uh, you can just a little wheel down at the bottom right hand corner is a little wheel. You can slow it down or normal, leave that on normal, but then you can adjust the quality. So if it looks a little blurry or something like that, you can adjust your quality a little bit higher depending upon your uh, internet connection, okay? And um, so we'll be going back and forth like that. And so as soon as we figure out all the cameras, which we did all here, so I'll be able to, to flip back and forth between some of the different uh, the different cameras and stuff here as, as we go here. So you'll be able to see that. So we're going to be showing you some different things. And bear with us, like I said, as we do this for the for the uh, the uh, very first time, we're, we're learning some of this as, as well. So we'll go down here again to the... Uh, to the uh, down shot here and uh, we'll set that up and we'll go okay so what I'm going to show you tonight is uh, I'm going to we're going to paint this this is a little lesser finch a uh, little lesser uh, gold finch and I'm going to put up here some what are called uh, some canary um, canary bird shrub roses and I'm going to I've drawn I've kind of sketched the design in but what I want to do is I want to kind of show you a little bit about the color because a painting has at least three parts. We're going to have color, we're going to have the design itself, and we're going to have the brush technique. So before I even start the painting here, I want to go into some of that with you. Okay. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to show you a couple examples. This is a little bush tit that I painted in our last book that I have. And um, so you can you can see this one in here. The books that I have, if you wanted to see step photos in great detail about a painting technique and stuff, these these uh, books we have for painting birds and flowers and stuff. This is the volume three of of that one. But I want to explain to you a little bit about uh, the colors and and why and the positioning of of the bush tit here. I like to position birds and and flowers in a composition. And one of the first things that I have to do is decide what is, uh, you know, what's going to be my, uh, you know, main uh, gaze of the bird. Here I have her looking just slightly up over her shoulder. The roses have a different gaze as well. So when I'm working um, on this bird here, I will put her gaze one way, and then I will usually use a smaller rose or something like that gazed in a little direction. Your job is to get the viewer to travel through a design. OK, and so that's one of the things I think about first. First, I find a bird that has an interesting uh, kind of a composition. And then what I do is I'll set up flowers around that bird that either encompasses it or uh, puts in like a cartouche, a frame for that bird. And then I'll adjust the, the flowers gaze so they're not all exactly the same as the bird. Because if I put all of these roses going this way, this design will have a tremendous amount of power going this way. 
The other thing I like to do is I like to do what we call vignette paintings. And on the YouTube videos and stuff that I show you, I don't always go into depth because I don't have time, but what I do and why I do it. I have my main power of my design going this way. The bird takes your eye this way. And so one of the things I try to do right away is to decide what I'm going to do with my background. Now, if I did the background strokes this way, I would have a tremendous amount of movement in the painting this way. So to help the bird pop forward, the strokes that I do into the background here, I do this way, which is counter to what I want the bird to do. How much streaking I leave into the, into the background is all going to depend upon how much detail I give to the bird. So when you start to look at other paintings here, uh, like this one I did in the last book, here I have the bird coming down this way. Now this bird has a lot of detail in it. I put a lot of work into his coverts, his primary and secondary flight feathers here, a lot of detail up into his face there. And um, so I can leave a few more streaks into the background. Now since he is keen color-wise, since he is keen off of orange, putting that nice bright brilliant blue here will really contrast against him bringing him forward. He is going this way. I want my streaks and stuff going this way so the the streak the, they create a contrast. I can't go this way because he would blend into the movement of the background. So I suggest I, I start my streaks going this way to um, to go against him. If I have a bird that I want to keep kind of a, a little contrast but a lot of small detail into him. Here I wanted to do a lot of small detail to it. Um, and so into this detail I had here, I can't have as much streaking into the background so that you see more, uh, some more detail. So you, that detail into the background would compete against the bird. And on this one, which is one that's out of our bird class that's coming up starting Monday, we'll start painting this one. Here I wanted to keep her very, very uh, detailed up into here so I kept the movement soft. Now her movement is this way. The, the flower movement here on this composition is this way here. So rather than push the flower too much this way, which would push the flower, I went up and down very softly this way. So I, I put up a little bit of a contrast. And this type of paintings here, let me set these back off to the side. These types of paintings really add a lot of, uh, of interest and movement to your painting. I do it with flowers as well when I'm going to paint flowers and I'm going to put up some vignette to the flowers here. I put up an angled move it this way and I decided to put a crossing movement across that way. The same one on, on this particular flower painting here. Let's step back just a little bit more on camera here. So the same one on this one putting in here. I haven't the, the bouquet angled here. So put it in lines of movement this way. Uh, contrast the bouquet and get my uh, get me a little bit more uh, power to the flower while I can still leave quite a bit of, of power into the uh, to the background there. I do it on stroke pieces too. This is a canthus piece here where I put the acanthus out at that angle so that the, it's moving in this way and I'll put in uh, horizontal and vertical lines uh, into the painting to uh, create some interest. Okay, so when you're talking about when you're talking about uh, doing a painting here, uh, one of the other things that we uh, we want to talk about is the um, is the actual colors and stuff that we're going to use. Okay, so you know now we have an idea of a design. I I put the bird in, I put the flowers in. The gazes don't match each other. Sometimes I use my background going the opposite way. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start picking out some of the colors and stuff that I use within the composition. So when I go to chart, start using colors in tonight's class, what I'm going to be doing is using a limited palette of six colors. But those six colors can still make all 12 colors around the color wheel. Okay, so we'll come back uh, down over here and let me show you. So on the, the 12 colors, when you have uh, your colors that you're going to use and we and we start out with a color wheel. And, you know, a lot of teachers say, oh, you know, a lot of artists just kind of blow past the color wheel. I use it all the time here. Tonight we're going to be painting a uh, basically a goldfinch, which is keen off the color yellow. And then if my goldfinch is, if I'm going to want my goldfinch to have a lot of contrast, that means I need to move my background this way over to this side of the 
of the composition. Some way I've got to either get in some violets, blue violets, into here. Now we're using a thalo blue, okay? And in the in the uh, heritage line, the thalo blue is actually a blue green right down in, into this area here which will keep a softer background. And so if I want a goldfinch, which we're gonna, I have some goldfinch pictures and stuff here that I'll show you during the composition here as we're painting. But um, if I want her to contrast, see here she's on a yellow background and she's not contrasting very much. If I want her to pop off even more, I've got to get my background over to this side over here. So that's one of the things I'll be looking at doing first is getting my background over here. So Thalo Blue, I'll be keying off of Thalo Blue, which I have in my six colors here. And I'll probably add some red violet here to take it a little bit more to the violet side. So I will contrast the yellow. That's my, that's my job is I wanna contrast it. Now, if you want the painting softer, you can put her against a yellow green background and you can see she'll be very, very soft, but she won't have as much power or contrast as like this bird does here. You can see the difference here between, in between this bird here. This bird here contrasts off of the blue, off the background because she has, this chipping sparrow has a lot of, of uh, orange, real toned orange in her head. And that's what keys off of that blue and pushes her forward and gives you a lot of depth. Whereas this one doesn't have as much. So if I painted her on a soft green background, you will lose some of the detail that you have in here as whereas here you can see it a little bit more. So Color theory is important and colors the colors that you choose are very very important. So tonight as we uh, start this painting uh, She is going to be she's going to be a little lesser finch here that we're going to start and um, I may have, Like I said, I have quite a few folders. Usually I put out quite a few photos. I have some some other ones here of this one and uh, I like this one uh, here and I like this one and when I went to do my sketch I kind of combined these two together I like the gaze of this one here but I liked her wings set back just a little bit more you see a little bit more of the body of this one so I when I went to go sketch it I put that all together I'm going to put her this way and then to show you a little bit about the colors, I'm going to put the gaze of the flowers down this way. Now, which way am I going to am I going to streak if I want to vignette this background? I'm going to go up and down because I don't I want her to come off the background, the background not to compete too much with her. And so I will start my soft streaking this way, and that will let the flowers and the bird both come forward but it, because it will create a very soft contrast. If I go this way, I give too much to the flowers here. And uh, if I go this way with that, she, she'll, be, uh, she'll be lost to the streaking of the background, okay? So first thing I, I am going to do is we have our board. This is a, a, like I say, it's an MDF panel and I base coated it. I just used a little bit of black and white and a tiny touch of yellow into the background to warm it up. Just a tiny touch, uh, just so that I get a, a, a nice compliment to her, which is going to be yellow. So that's some of the thought processes that I do uh, within the, in the painting. As we get going here, I'll go a little bit more into the design. Those of you that are in the bird class, um, later on, uh, later on this month, I actually started on Monday, I'm going to go into exactly how to draw a bird, how to put the, the break it up into its different parts, its feathers, its flight feathers, how to, and we'll go in a little bit more depth of drawing a bird, putting it into a thing, into a, a painting, choosing what type of flower, what makes it, what is a good flower to put with a, with a bird in a composition. And we'll go into a lot of that because we have a lot, we have 10 lessons to go through on that. Okay. So let's get started over onto this one. So I'm going to be using the six color set. I'm going to take out some extender here with my three quarter inch brush here. And these colors are all colors I've mixed up a little bit of, of uh, extender into. So they have about, about an hour's worth of drying time here under the, a lot of lights that we flood this, uh, this uh, with. We, uh, we might uh, get a little bit drying a little faster, but it'll be, we'll be fine. So First thing I'm going to do is like I have to decide how am I going to do my background and vignette my background. Now, as I'm painting along here, one of the things here, as I'm painting along here, if you have any kind of questions whatsoever, just go ahead and put them into the chat because Jessica's right over there, right? 
Hello. Yeah, she's right over there. She's all mic'd up. She has a microphone and everything. If you have any kind of questions of what we're doing, then you just ask away. And uh, I'll answer those questions as we get going. Now, the other thing that we're dealing with, and we're learning all of this stuff because this is our first one. Um, but, you know, we've done thousands of videos, but we have never done a live broadcast. And one thing that we're dealing with right now is there's a 10 second delay from what I'm doing right now in the studio to what you're seeing. And so when we're monitoring what's going on, it's a little bit confusing sometimes which screen you're watching and which, what's going on, okay? So there's a little bit of a delay. So there'll be a little bit of a delay when you answer a question to when I can come back and answer that question for you. But don't be afraid, just type it right there into the chat and then Jessica will answer it for you or I'll answer it for you. She's mic'd up too, okay? So just fire away as, I, as I'm going here okay here we go elizabeth asks what is extender exactly extender oh very good question elizabeth extender there are all different kinds of extenders and retarders that are in acrylics and i've built three different acrylic paint systems over the 35 years that i've been involved as an artist and there's different types of extenders extenders are basically they're a natural product um they're an alkene product and they they are in, in most of your extenders are propylene glycol based now that's a, a thing that you buy as you can get as a food preservative and so on and so forth but some extenders are different some retarders are different from each other ours is is a food grade it's actually kosher it's a food grade uh, propylene glycol base that gets added right directly to our paints our binder the glue within the paint is uh is built exactly for that extender so they work very well together uh, other companies older paint systems their extenders will be a little bit different this is why i always say you can't use our extender with a different acrylic and expect it to work they will not work exactly the same it, you know paint systems are like computers over you know the 30 years computers have gotten smaller faster and can do a lot more things and so have paints and our paint system is only seven years old, so we're we're really on the cutting edge of what it can do, okay? So extender is a propylene glycol. It is a very nice, it is, it's non-toxic. You can put it all over your hands. Matter of fact, if you go uh, read a lot of your hand lotions, flip it over to the back, you'll see propylene glycol in a lot of your hand lotions. It's in a lot of things and some eye drops and all different kinds of stuff besides food. It's used in food as, as a... Um, as a preservative and stuff inside of food so but it's uh, something that works very well and slide and dries very slow for us so extender and what i'm going to do is if i take out my blue here and i put my blue down this is my thalo blue here that i have here we'll get rid of that glare there this is my thalo blue now if i go add some white to this thalo blue you'll see this blue is really more of a of a blue green okay it's really more of a blue green now if i put her with that uh because you know following along the the line of our color wheel you see it's right here this is really it's more towards this blue green color uh, rather than a, a solid blue that would be that would make her very soft and tonight what I want to do is paint her with just a little bit more contrast so what I'm going to do is just reach over and grab a little bit of my red violet touch that in and take my violet here more towards a blue violet here and so you can see the blue green going right over to a blue violet now the other thing I have to decide is how light usually I go pretty light with it up what we call in value up around an eight or seven or an eight i'm going to start out about a seven or so here tonight just right about what my background is so it's gone more to the violet which that violet will will contrast more that violet will contrast more take a little bit of our yellow here that violet will contrast more here with the yellow than what the uh than what the uh, blue with the blue green does okay so I, that's one reason why I'm picking this particular color. Now, from what I said earlier, our flowers are going this way, our birds going this way. And so what I want to do is I want to start some of my streaking that I'm going to do right here like this to start my background, right up and down softly this way. Because I love vignetted paintings and I do a lot of selling of art and vignetted paintings sell very well for me. They're different. Sometimes I paint on a solid background but many times I like to, to to vignette the color, and so I'll like let it run out on this side here. I might do a little bit of 
uh, back and forth right in here to soften it right in there. But I'd like that to vignette like that. Now, you've covered up your bird. So there's two ways to approach it here. I can just barely lightly see the bird there. And so usually what I'll do is I'll back out my pattern just a little bit here, my sketch here, so I can see that. And I usually like to have the background quite heavy. So I will apply it a couple of times here. And as we paint, as we paint, a lot, one of, the, one of the things I want you to concentrate on and one of the things I want you to watch here um, on my palette, and I'll have to remember we've got a little bit of glare there that we'll have to fix later on, is I want you to watch the consistency of my paint, okay? Consistency, consistency is one of the most important parts about painting. And if I can, you know, say to you, what is going to make you uh, do a technique easier than anything else is the consistency of the paint. Okay. We, since these paints are made from ground pigments, the same pigments that are used in oils, we, we are going to follow what oils do. That the thicker paint on top of thinner paint. Okay. And so as I paint, I'm going to start getting a little thicker and a little thicker with my paint. And um, what that does is that not only allows it to stick uh, to the color, it's going to give more power to my painting at the end. But consistency. So many acrylic artists, since our medium is water, we usually start out with our paints too thin. And that's the one thing as you watch videos, as you watch my teaching and watch what I do, I want you to watch the consistency of my paint. I usually paint a lot thicker than a lot of other people do in acrylic artists and I want you to uh, to watch that so for example if you look at my white okay I'll take a dollop of my titanium white this is the consistency of my titanium white okay now a lot of acrylics and especially uh, especially fluid acrylics can't do this but I like my white to be the consistency of toothpaste. And so I like, and that will give me, uh, you know, a couple of things. One, very opaque color, but the other thing is it allows me to put one color on top of the other really easy because that, that white is so very thick, okay? So I want you, as I paint here tonight, to watch the consistency, and I'll try to point it out a few times as I get going here. As I, if I want to add more into this bird, I, and put more streaks or more interest and stuff up into this bird, I will make the paint a little bit thicker here. So as I start to cover up, we'll put a, a little bit more white into that so we get a little lighter streak right down through that area there. Now she's gonna, I'm gonna give her quite a bit of detail, so I'm gonna keep this streaking kind of soft here, like this, okay? And you can see now that my paint's thicker, boy, she's really gone there like that. And I'm going to back her back out again so I can see my my uh, design just a little bit. Just, just so I can just barely see it. That's where I like to, to keep that. I will sometimes come back and do this background several times. Now for the bottom of the design here, so I have the blue. Sometimes I'll let the blue just fade out down here and just keep all blue behind her. Sometimes I put in the... Uh, in the uh, you know, a feeling of bushes or the tree or something like that. And you can make a bunch of variety of greens, which we'll show you with the limited palette. This is, again, this is the six color uh, limited palette for the Painted Simply. Blue and Hansa Yellow make very bright, bright greens. You can go very bright yellow greens here with this. The older, more traditional olive greens that com paint companies make are really just black and a yellow. And so you make that, you make the olive greens here, like this, these colors here. And I always tell my students, you know, and stuff in seminars and stuff, and I paint, if you don't know which way to go, just put both of them together and find yourself a nice medium green that you want to work with. Now, if I want this to tone down, what is the opposite of green here? The opposite of green is going to be my red. Now, if I put in, so if, which red do I use? I have two reds on here. Okay, which red do I use? This one is warm and will make the background warm. And this color right here leans very close to here, to this color here. So the contrast would be a little, it'll tone it, but the contrast would be a little less. This one's cool. This one's already inside 
my blue sky. So, and this one will contrast more with the yellow. So I'll probably keep it, this one a little cool and I'll add just a little, just take just a little bit of this red right up here. It takes just a little here and I'll tone this down just a touch, put a little extender with that. And let's just run this right through here. And all I'm gonna do is add some movement. I don't want, because I'm going to have a lot of, I've decided I'm going to have a lot of uh, detail in her. I don't want to come in here and put just big, huge, heavy streaks of color like that because that will fight against her. I want my movements to be a little softer. So I will use this, I will stroke the brush several times through here. I'll put a little bit of movement here, sometimes counter movement, sometimes with it, a little bit of movement this way. Sometimes I like to take a little bit of the green right up behind her, like there's going to be other things back behind there, like that. And uh, softly put a little movement this way, because this, this guy's going to, this yellow is going to be going this way. I'll let some of the blue show up, but maybe I'll put a little bit of the green right up through that and create kind of a, a nice envelopment of her this way. The most important part about her is going to be her head. So I don't, I want to have it clear basically behind her head and everything else coming in this way, which is going to kind of cradle her like this. Okay. That's how I like to set it up. That's how I set up a lot of them. Now, sometimes I will come in and just soften back. I'll use my paper towel and create some, just some gentle movement this way through the painting here, because that's the way my, uh, my flowers are going to go. Okay. Yeah. Um, Artie Frog asks um, about smearing. If you're using a pencil, how do you prevent it from smearing the design? Ah, very good. How, well, first off, water, well, let's go back over here. Water will smear your pencil quite a bit, okay? Glycol does not, propylene glycols do not smear a pencil as much as that. The other thing is that you can, if I push real hard onto my painting, I will get smearing on it. That's, that's just going to happen because the graphite is just sitting there on the surface very, very lightly. I'm going to be painting so heavy, everything covers up. You won't be able to see any of it. So I don't really worry about that. And usually uh, when I'm wiping back through there, I'm taking off all of the excess graphite and uh, that really doesn't become a problem. I don't worry about smearing too much because I paint so opaque. Now, if you're going to um, paint lightly, take a, take a damp paper towel with a uh, little bit of water and wipe over that first. Take off that extra graphite first. Okay, and then when you come in with the paint, then you won't have that type of problem. But I'm doing, and this is something acrylic artists work with because so many of our acrylics that we work with in acrylic industry are what we call flow acrylics or thin acrylics. They're made with the base, they're 40, 50% water. And so they, they tend to, to smear and they're so thin, they tend not to cover that up too much. And when I'm painting like this, you don't see the smearing going on. Let me flip over here to the down shot here. When I paint up here like this, you don't see the smearing going on into my design here. And that's because I'm using a lot of glycol into the paint and less water and more glycol. And uh, it will remove some of the excess. But if I press real hard, I can get a little bit of smearing. But I just use a regular number two pencil. This is what I sketched it with right before we started the class. And, um, you know, it, it works uh, quite well. But since I'm going to be doing so opaque, I'm not going to worry about that too much. So now we can start the bird here. One of the things we can do is start the bird. But I like to come in and also at the same time put in some of the other colors. Now, sometimes I go right to the bird and paint the bird all the way through. Sometimes I'll put in some accent colors all the way through. I'm going to be painting what are called canary, and I, I get photos. These are the canary bird. Um, they are a uh, shrub rose. I'm going to be painting these. And they have some yellows and a little bit of oranges in them and stuff like that. But I'm also got to, I've got to take these and be artistic with these flowers here because I want to have a subtle contrast with her. And so what am I going to, I'm going to start out with some yellow here. I'll put some yellow, but I want to subtly contrast her. First, I'm going to tone that yellow down. 
To tone that yellow down, I'll go pretty much to its complement up here and cool it down with a little bit of red violet. Sometimes I'll even toss a little bit of the red and the blue in here, put a little bit of that blue in there, and you can see I can just start to tone and gray that color right on down here like this. So I start with a color that's like this, okay? and I start to tone it down. Now, why does that work? This is almost a compliment. If I add a little bit of blue, blue and red are into your violets, and then you're right into an, a, a direct compliment here. So add a little extender here, so this moves a little bit more here. If it goes too green on you, then get a little bit more to the violet, and you'll go more towards the orangey war, uh, uh, orange color here, okay? Uh, adding a red like this will make more of your orange and your warmer colors. So sometimes within a, in a painting, if I'm going to go with yellows and stuff, sometimes I'll put in a variety of yellows going through some cools, some colors like this, right up over here towards the orangey type of colors that will all play against here. These are warm. These are cool. This is a little bit more toned. This is a little safer color here than this one just because we want this painting to be about a bird, right? So I'll keep, I'll go right over here to my, my cooler one here mostly. I'll take some of that excess paint out. And I'm just going to cast, I just do this. These are just areas that I might have flowers. I'm not even going to specifically paint flowers. I'm just going to dance a little bit of my color through here. You don't want to paint the flowers before you paint the bird. She is the center of interest in this composition. But I do want to add some where I might want to have some flowers where I might want to have a little flower there, come up through and move some of that color. I might take some, uh, let's take a little red here and a little bit of our red violet. And since she's going to be yellow here, let's just cast a little bit of this color through the painting as well. This will help contrast, contrast her here. And just and I like to use my hands. You don't have to worry about using your hand with these acrylics. They're all 100% non-toxic. So I like to use my hands. Now these are just blurry ideas of color down through here. We have greens. I can restate some if I want to get a little bit more powerful green in there. I can restate some green. But this gives me a good a good look to some color that will be around her yet. And we can of course change a lot of things later on. Can you try propping this underneath your wax Yeah, palette? here we go. Yeah, maybe, maybe a little bit more. more. Yeah. So we don't get that glare. Here we go. That yeah, that's, yeah, better. that works better. Uh-huh. So <clears throat> now that just gives me some an idea. I might want to put just a, a little bit brighter. So I pick up a little more Hansa yellow. I decide if you want to paint a painting or flowers or so that have a tremendous amount of depth, like if you want to get more depth within a flower here, putting light, but also putting bright, keep them softer back out through here, put a little bit more color up into the front. So somewhere up and around her, right in here where I might have a, a, a little bit more of a um, one of the shrub roses right up into this area, I'll put a little bit more color. And of course, these will get lights and this will change, but this will help me see just a little bit of depth. Don't drag it everywhere because then you'll start to flatten out the design, okay? So that starts really, really soft. And so, and that's what I want to do. I just want to see modeling of color and really soft, nothing very specific. This is quite different than what I did in decorative painting for many, many, many years where we would put on a palette pattern and we'd fill it all in. Now I'm going to start very, very casual, and we'll slowly build this design up as, as we get into the painting. But now it's time to start our uh, start her, and like I say, she'll be kind of our, our center of interest here, our, our main interest uh, you know, into the painting. I'm going to grab a couple of my bird photos that I have here to reference to. She is a, a, a beautiful bird, and we have a lot of them here in Pennsylvania. She has a lot of yellows in here, so we're going to need to make a variety of yellows, all the way down to almost this olive color that you have here into these browns, and I'll show you how we're going to make that with the, little, uh, with the limited palette. How bright we make 
uh, this yellow part you know, uh, in her right here uh, is going to be depending on how much contrast, because you can see this one here has that bright yellow there. So photos, the same, same species of bird, photos will make them look a little bit different. You can do the same thing with your with your painting here. How much bright or how much Hansa yellow we're gonna put right into there to pop her forward. That's why I like it. I like this one, but I turned it the other way. But I love the yellow and the pop and the contrast that's right in here, going right to these real uh, soft yellow olive green colors that are right into there. So I'm gonna be keying a lot of my colors off of that particular photo, the drawing off of the <laughs> off of the other one. And so we'll get it all done here. I'm going to, um, I start out now, as far as technique wise here, I have two main painting brushes that I really like to do birds with. And here's a smaller version of the flat. I do a flat and I do the point of a round. And there's quite a bit of difference in the technique that I, that I do. Uh, this one combines both. I use a, a point of the round if I want to paint a bird that has a tremendous amount of detail in it. Okay, and I use um, the flat brush, the flat brush like a, four, a two or a four, if I want to make a bird more painterly. Now, in the class, in the online class, I'm going to show you 10 different bird painting techniques to get different things. But one of the things that we can key on right now is the brush is, is going to uh, control how much detail that we're going to be doing here onto our bird. So if I do the majority of the painting here, and I'll show you some of this, paint it with the, the flat, I'm going to make a bird that looks uh, quite a bit more painterly. And if I do this, then I can make a bird that has quite a bit more detail uh, work to it. So I'll show you some of the differences as, uh, as we get into the paintings here. It really, the brush really does make a difference. And I use, sometimes I will finish the entire painting with a flat. I will never go to a detail brush. Depends on the bird, and I'll show you that. So I'm going to start out first. Let's start out first here with a smaller flat brush, okay? And I'll paint this. Matter of fact, let's just go first with one that I use a lot of times if I want a bird to be really painterly. This is a number four. And first thing I'm going to do, is I'm going to come into a bird, pick any one of the birds you want, and I'm going to find an undertone. I'm going to find a tone here when you look at this. When you look at this bird here, you can see it's got a bright yellow, and then you can see that yellow diminishing up underneath here. You see it coming through a little bit here. You see this kind of brownish yellow that comes in through here. Do you see that down through there? This will be more of our shadow tone, our dark contrasting shadow tone. This will be more of our brighter tone that we'll have right in here, our lighter tone. This will be our undertone. It's kind of a real toned kind of yellow. It is slightly, like right in here, you'll see almost an orangey type of cast on it. Depends on your monitor, orangey type of cast. Down here, a little bit more of a greenish type of cast onto it. Do you see that? Okay, so a light, warmer orange cast here. There's a greenish cast underneath there. That's what I look for. Because just like I showed you here onto this palette of colors when we go to make them, we can have an orange, a greenish undercast here, or we can have an orangey undercast here. So this orangey undercast that I have here is a nice color. One color that I like to make uh, when I paint birds like this is a brown. And sometimes in the, when I have more of expanded palette, I use burnt sienna. But on this palette, I take two parts red to one part black. Now, I don't make up a bunch of it because I like this color to change. Sometimes I add just a touch of yellow to that. And this will become my painting brown here. Okay, And this is a beautiful color. You see, it's a beautiful brown color here that I can use to to tone in here with some of my other colors. And if I stay here, I can tone this to an, a beautiful, warm, orangey kind of yellow. Let's add just a bit more yellow to that here. Okay, right into here. And that's a, that's a beautiful tone right into there. And you'll see that tone right there, right underneath her right there, okay? Now, but if I put that up here, it's too warm, it's too red here or right over here it's a little bit too warm too red so I need to go over to this other side and then I can do it with a, a cooler red violet but that won't get me quite as much to that olive green that I want to have 
which which what makes the yellow the olive green the black so if i put this black into this color that's right over here and now i have a warmer kind of a a, 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 a orangey type of tone and a warm a tone over here it's a little cooler and it's a little more olive green and that will be the tone here on the top of her that you see there see that and you'll see that tone down here to the underside sometimes i tell my students just take a piece of clear plastic and put it over your photo and you should be able to to make that color now yeah Paul asks if you can use frisket to protect the bird before you paint it. Yeah, absolutely. But we don't need to. We're artists. <laughs> <laughs> we just power right on through. <laughs> but you can use frisket for it. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There is a, So I have my two main base tones here. One's kind of warm and orangey, and one's kind of a little bit to the greenish side, more of the olive green side. And I'll vary it, and sometimes I'll put the two tones... Uh, together on the brush at the same time here. So I found my main painting tones here for for her, the undertone, and then we'll adjust it and change it a little bit as we paint here. Now that's very important. Now, a, one thing that I, I, I do want to point out that, that's really important, okay? Because a, a lot of people think, I can't paint with limited palettes, okay? Well, you see a photo that's like this, okay? This is printed with four inks from your printer. I just went and printed this on our laser printer. It has four inks, okay? And the four inks basically are the colors that I have in here. It has a cyan, a, 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 a yellow, and um, the cyan, which is more of a blue-green. It has a yellow, a magenta, and black. Those are your printing inks there. So if you see it in a photo, you should be able to mix it with the six color set. That's why I do a lot of painting. I've done over 600 paintings, uh, lessons, painting lessons with the six color set. Because if you're following a photo, you should be able to make those colors and pretty darn close to those colors. So you can see this greenish tone even works on this one over here. That's the greenish tone of her underneath there. You just need to be able to see it. Then you see it gets a warmer orangish tone here before it heads over to the brighter yellow. So once you uh, once you understand that, well, I guess I didn't show you guys that there. <laughs> so this one, this greenish, sorry about that, wrong camera. I That's the greenish tone that you see there, okay? Then I'll have this warm orangish tone right here before it goes over to this uh, yellow right into there, okay? So even on the other bird, it works on both the birds. That's the undertone of this little lesser finch, okay? That's the undertone color. And so that's what I'm going to start with. So when I look at the lesser finch and I'm going to paint her up through here, I'm going to start with more of the greenish tone here up into this area. Now, so I'll put some of that right into my brush here, some of this greenish tone. And as I start to paint here, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to start using small. I use small little strokes like this, almost straight little strokes. I don't curve. And I'm following the contours of her head. This is what her feathers aren't just big long ones that she combs back here, like you know, like long hair. No, they're short little feathers. So you have to make short strokes following the contour that sets up that area there. And let's get just a and I I always kind of change the tone a little bit. I'll model that through. We'll set that inside her right there, like that. This tone also appears down here onto her her mantle which is the back along the coverts here and or, or what we call her shoulder here this area the protection of this here we'll get just a little bit more I'll change the tone just a little bit to I like to do this to get some modeling of the tone I don't like the tone to be always perfect I like it to constantly change and that's what I spend a, a lot of time doing it's changing the tone. But we want these to go this way and this way and this way and this way. On a bird, the smallest feathers are up around the head. The largest feathers are down into this area. So you notice my strokes are going to get a little longer as I come down here in this part of her here. Now, let's take a little bit of our warmer tone. Let's make that just a little bit. Uh, let's take this right over here. Let's make that a little bit more yellow. Here, a little bit more warm tone. Now, this is her cheek. Now, when you look at her, when you look at her cheek here, you can see the direction of the feathers. Do you see that? Look at these small feathers here. That goes this way, goes this way, goes this way, goes this way, down, 
this way. So watch the direction. Here you see it go this way, and it's her back. This is what's her what we call her mantle. So she's going to go this way, and then they're going to curve this way, and then as they pass the crest, the, the middle part of her body, which is right in here, they'll start falling out the other way. So we want to make sure when we stroke that that's what we do because those little strokes and streaks are so very important to her shape. So I'm going to keep this orange tone in here. I want to strike against here like in her cheek and then slowly move it this way down here. So I'm going to take this orangey tone, warmer tone right in here on her cheek and I'm slowly going to move it down this way, this way there. So you, you'll see just a few little streaks, but we need to see a little bit of it. Then I'm going to walk a few touches of that tone out into some of my green tone here just to break it up just a bit here. And so now you start to see a little bit of modeling into there. She's a uh, little uh, finch, so she has a lot of little feathers between her beak and, and her eye there. She's going to have some darker color, so I'm going to go pick up some brown, maybe a bit of the black here and but it's slightly a, a, a very very actually dark yellow green so I'll add a little bit of Hansa to that here and let's get some of this dark that will be right in around her eye follow the contours going around here we'll tap some of that in and this is where I, when I'm using the big brush I'll use just the corner of that big brush to put some of this in so the detail stays softer and she stays a little bit more painterly. I'll add just a few streaks of that down in through here just to break up that tone. This is what gives them a little bit more interest. And you'll see, we'll cover some of this up, but look at it, you'll see some of those darks that are right into there. Half of painting, half, half of what we do as an artist and what we do when we're painting is we're we're learning to see and this is when I was a decorative painter I kept everything very simplistic and as I became more into the arts and painting and wanted to get my birds a little bit more realistic I started to look a little bit closer at the direction of the strokes and how many tones do I see in there and what's warm and what's cool and that becomes very very important so part of it is just slow down and see and learn to see see the tones and that takes a little bit of time to train your eye Okay, it takes a little bit of time to train your eye to see some color, but you can paint some nice paintings along the way as well. Okay, you can do that. So, so we have this color here. Now she'll have a little bit of that dark that'll appear right up here onto uh, part of her uh, mantle right there. And sometimes I like to do this and pull through. See what your finger can do when that paint is really thick? It can blur it like that just a bit and still give you some nice movement there and that when you see this right there that means that paints on there really thick and it is it's really really stiff paint that I'm painting with here and um, that really gives you a nice movement to it okay so now one of the things I like to do is I'm going to take some of this brown I'm going to touch it into the back part of her eye yes I'm going to paint her eye not in detail yet matter of fact uh, I'm going to uh, do it uh, pretty casual here. We'll come in a little closer here, okay? And I'm going to paint it. I'm going to paint it a little bit more painterly, a little bit more casual. I start in with very soft lines here. Left just a, a little bit of the light color that goes around uh, the this bird there. Stream is offline. Oh wait, no. It went back. Oh, it went back on stream. We're good. Okay. okay. A little bit of break in the stream there. Yeah. yeah it just went off. It says, "Oh, we lost you." Oh, yeah, you're back. You're back. Yeah. Well, there's ice storms and stuff outside too, because there could be power glitches and stuff that happen too. So sorry. <laughs> okay. So I tap that little bit of black right in there, and the black to the front and I use just a corner of the brush so it's not a perfect I can make it perfect later but I try to keep all of my color movements everything that I'm doing very casual for right now okay very very casual I'm going to uh, mix up a little bit more of that brownish tone we'll drop a little bit back in here I'm just going to streak some of this through this area here just while I have it here We'll streak some tone through. We'll paint the feathers there a little bit and streak just a little tone through this area here. And that's just to get a little bit of tone going in those areas as well. So I soften that in there. Let's take, let's come over here to our uh, 
to our black and white and uh, right into this area black and white a little bit of yellow into this as well we'll make ourselves a nice soft kind of warmish gray and if you look if you really look at it you at her beak here it's gray but you can pick up some orangey and yellow. There's orange coming in there and yellow tones that are in there. You don't have to get it in there exactly, but those are tones that we're gonna to wanna to lean to here. So lean into some of this area. And so when I first start in her beak, I'm just gonna use the chisel here of this larger brush. This is gonna keep the beak very relaxed and not perfect right now. And that's where I wanna keep the painting. So I'm gonna start some of that tone in there. I might take a little bit of the orange and just touch into a, that beak with a little bit of orange because I know orange is going to be in there. I have a little bit of dark tone and I know I'm going to put a little bit of the dark tone in there. So this is some of the, the interest that I, you know, I put into birds. And this is like when you look at this one here, that's one of the ways that I get some of that interest coming into this bird here. I'm going to work these tones. Now, when I go to paint a beak like this, I paint it casually back and forth with these tones. And this one's been painted about four times to get it to, to look like that. And uh, that's what I do. And you can look at some that have more detail, the longer one here on this guy. You know, you can see the strokes and the different colors and tones that I put inside of there. You can see all the detail that I put inside his eye and everything here. And uh, that's what that little round brush will do. We're not going to go quite that detailed on her, but that's what that little round brush will do. So I'm just going to put that in right now. I'm going to leave that very, very casual. I'm going to leave that right now uh, with those colors. And I'm going to jump over to some of my Hansa Yellow. Let's jump over, let's get that Hansa yellow, maybe a little bit of the warm tone in that as well here. So I have a little bit of the green and a little bit of the orange here together into the Hansa yellow. And let's come in here and let's put in the first little bit of the brighter yellow here that will come in this part of her here and drop that down. And so I'm not as bright as I can be. I'm just putting in some of the, this, like I say, is the undertone color here. So I want just a little bit. And again, it's not perfect. A lot of times I'll just take my finger and run this through like this. So I get a little bit of that. I want this variation of the tone. We can take a little bit more Hansa Yellow. And when you look at that Hansa Yellow, some if you're doing it more painterly, I would find the main stroke. Like if I was going to do this bird more painterly and less detail, I would find the main stroke, which is going to come off of this beak area here and pull down that way there. You have another one coming out that way and down this way. So if I was going to do more painterly, what a painterly artist does is they, they break the majority of the strokes up into just a couple of strokes. So we would pull a stroke down like this. We would pick up a little more paint and we would pull a stroke down like that and maybe a stroke down into there like that. So that leaves the bird a little bit more painterly and you can stroke it a couple times here, but you're setting up the direction of those feathers there, just like that, okay? And what you don't wanna do is stroke and stroke and stroke and stroke because then all those streaks are gone. And this big brush, just by painting thick like that, starts to give you the impressions of little feathers there. If I go to a smaller brush like this, my streaks will be less and my color more opaque like that. And so I lose some of that. Uh, that's why finding the right type of brush is gonna be important here. But I can always take a little bit of my brown or a little color here and do what I call back paint up through it this way and I can create some streaks back up into that again as well so there's a lot of techniques I'm going to be showing you a lot of different techniques and that we use on birds and flowers and stuff but so I'll pull some out this way we'll pull some down that just gives a little bit now we have that brighter yellow we have that oranger tone we have our yellow green tone coming through here and she is starting to take on some of the tone that you will see uh, into the bird here. That's what we're looking for, okay? Now, down here in this area, she has uh, more yellow. This one here is more of the, of the yellow green as it comes through here. And I will probably on her, 
go more of the yellow green and one reason why is because I want this to be about her face and if I go more towards the yellow green that's going to come and blend right down in here into my yellow areas of my painting and my yellow and my green areas excuse me of my painting and she'll softly disappear down into this area which is what I want okay so now we have her in there now let's break a little bit lighter color and we're going to come through with a little just a few strokes of the lighter yellow green this will break up this tone just a bit now we'll end up painting out some of those darks which we'll go put back in again so I'll go pick up a little bit of black with that here we'll make that color a little bit darker back into these blacks maybe a touch of that brown just so I like to vary the tone I always like to change the tone a little bit and I'll touch a little bit of that back into this area here and up and around. You see I'm painting her again. She's getting a little more contrast. Now I start to look also, there's a very important stroke and a lot of birds have it. You see this darker stroke that comes right out of the eye. As a matter of fact, in, in um, a, a lot of the nut hatches and stuff like that types of birds, they have a, a one that goes really, a light band there that goes really quite far with their, right in their, their right into their beak there you'll find that uh, that particular line but uh, uh, I like to I like to state that right about now from the back of the eye I'll just pull out that line right there and that line usually on on a lot of the birds especially into the finches that line is right in line with the beak line that's going to come down through there so and then sometimes I pull it out like that and that gives a nice little feathering look in there like that now let's go back. This is where, you know, you, I constantly, if you notice, I've never cleaned my brush. I'm going to go back over here towards my yellow oranges here. Matter of fact, we'll put a little more, a little bit more Hansa into that. We'll brighten that up a bit, just a bit. And this is that cheek color again. So now I'm going to change the tone slightly and redo the cheek area in here and build the color into that area again. And yes, if you learn, if you lose a little bit of that, um, that brown line, we're going to put it back in. I paint back and forth several times. This is what's going to give you the color depth. And each time I'm getting more opaque. And so you're starting to see some of the color depth. I might take a few touches of this even up into this area, up and around the, the beak that you see right in there. Carries that tone right through to break up the the uh, Hansa yellow here. I might take a stroke or two right up in here of this color just to break that up. I might come down the her breast area here with a little bit of this color right in there just to, to brighten that up a bit. Now before I go too much further I'm going to set some of the contrast that I want to see into the painting and that's going to be my Hansa yellow with a little bit of white. This is my bright light color and I'm going to come in here and do it again, right down in here. Be brave with it. Stroke this out here. And you'll notice it just kind of sets up with those tones there. If I wanted this to be more painterly, I would do it with the, with the bigger brush like this. All of the strokes here with the bigger brush here like that. And again, if I wanted it to be more detailed, I'll go with the small brush. I'll show you that in a second, what the, what the difference between the two brushes will be. But I'll go a little bit of a light tan color. So I'll take this light color, maybe a bit of my brown here, a light tan color here down this part of her breast area here. And notice when I go down, one of the things I do, and I, I don't know, I sometimes forget to mention it, but I go longer strokes as I go down the body where the longer feathers are. And that's one of the things I study in birds is, where larger feathers are, where smaller feathers are, and I just match my stroke uh, direction and my uh, stroke size, the length of the stroke that I do with those areas. Now, as you paint like that, you're going to lose some of those, and I want you to, you lose some of those tones, and you go back and you restate some of those tones again. That is where you get the subtle changes back and forth, and we'll push through like that and you get more of those subtle tones working through her like that. And it works really, really well. Um, 
if we want to come in and put some detail up around the eye, one of the things I do is I take this flat like this and I leave that little bit of light right there by the eye. And I'm just going to come in with a, a shadow. That's an underlying shadow underneath the eye ring and pull that out like that, down like that. Now that's too much shadow. But when you look at a photo of a bird like this, you'll see that shadow is sitting in the underline right underneath there. Now, if I'm going to do it more painterly, I'd use the big brush and I'd use the edge of the brush and just pull a little color through like that. If I want my bird to be more detailed, that's where I'm going to go over to a brush that's like this here. And I'll take a little bit of my white and yellow and I'll put it onto this one here. I use just the tip of the brush right into this area. This is what makes very small, dainty little feathers that are always right around the tip of the beak that's right in there like that. And I usually paint in a few too many because I'm I'm a most of the techniques that I do, I do I put too much on and I paint out what I don't need. Now, when you look up real close at her here, when you start looking at the details here, these lights come this way this one comes down like that. Do you see that? So I want to make sure I capture that part of the painting here. And as I start to put that detail on in here, little tiny touches of the feathers, leaving some of that brown underneath that, that shadow there, her eye will start to come forward or start to pop off there just a little bit. And I'll take some of the yellow green here and I paint backwards like this. This sets up some of your little light feathering that will happen in there at the top of her head right in there like that and like I say sometimes I'll do a little bit too much and then I'll come back with some dark and take that back out there like that now we'll come down we start to look at a little bit of detail we'll come down bring that eye down a little bit closer here and then I'll start to work on the eye. So this is what I do with the round. And in some of the paintings I do, I do all of this with the corner of a flat so they stay more painterly. But I'll work that eye just a little bit more. So see, I paint into the eye and then I'll just take a little black and clean it up. I like, I like this little bit of light that's right here. So I take just a little bit of light. I like this little bit of light that comes on the under part of her eye right here. And again, I'll paint too much here. I like that. That's right there. And because I paint too much, now I've got to take my brush with a little bit of brown and just lightly poke back into that and just push some of that out. That's the easiest way to do. Rather than trying to put in a thin, thin, thin little line, that's the easiest way. You poke back into it. If I want to make smaller little feathers up into this area, I'll just poke back up into that area there pull out sometimes, we'll poke back into that, take a little bit of dark here, we'll take out just a few of those, and you see you start to get some of the, the nice beautiful coloring around here. Let's take a little bit of warm tone. I really paint the eye quite, quite a bit, and we, uh, quite a bit of detail to it. How are they doing, Jay? Are they still with me? Yep, yep. Uh, right. Everybody is doing great. Okay. So I'm just going to restate that dark just a little bit more right around that eye. There, that'll work with that. She'll need a shine. A lot of people go right to white. I never use pure white on the shine, so I'm going to tap a little bit of brown into that. We'll put a little bit of a shine here. Again, bigger than what I want. Then I touch my, my brush with a little bit of black or white. And I just kind of poke into it till I get it to about the size that I want that to happen. Sometimes you'll have a, um, a low light, which is uh, not like the highlight. It's a little bit more gray. You might put up a, a little bit of a light like right there and you start getting the eye a little bit more realistically. So now when I come back into here, yeah. Uh, Birdie Blue asks, um, it says, so just tads of extender only on the brush? Yeah. And has the other acry acrylic dried? No, not on completely. On the rest of the bird? No. Everything that I have here, even from my original flowers, is still all wet here. She's concerned so, about muddying her paint. No. You get muddy colors. Yeah. You, um, you, get, uh, you get muddy colors when you use 
pigments or colors or, or acrylics that don't have much pigment in them. Okay, that's what gives you muddy colors. The heritage are, are loaded with uh, with pigment. So you can paint out one color right into the other. You see me painting out with Hansi Yellow, which is even a semi-transparent pigment, uh, painting out some of my brown with that. That's because the paints are loaded with pigments. So muddy colors come from paints that don't have enough pigment in them. Okay, and so when you use concentrated pigment, these are concentrated, you don't get muddy colors. And so that's that's what uh, we do here. I never worry about muddy colors. Okay, Jessica just gave me a thumbs up, so everyone understood that. Okay, so I'm going to come back now, back up here by her, her eye. I'm going to take a little bit of my brown and black, and I'm going to reset some of this darker color back up in through here, which I want to see. I'm going to reset some of this back down in through here. And this this brush does more detail. I paint in reverse like this. And this brush is a synthetic squirrel. And so it has a, a wonderful little, um, you know, you get this little bit, it looks just like feathers because it it's not a very stiff brush. It's a very, very soft, soft brush. And so it just kind of, you just lightly glide it over the surface like this. And that's what gives you this real fine look. It's kind of the brush does it. You just got to kind of po point it in the right way. And then I'll come back and I'll paint the yellow back into that area again. So now I'm getting a, quite a few tones happening right in there. And let's put just a stroke or two of a little warmer orangey tone right in there. Maybe right back into here. And you can see that difference, what that does to her. That changes her up there quite a bit. Um, let's put, uh, let's come back out here while we're here. Let's put a, a brown grayish tone back up on the tip of the beak right up here, here like this. And you can work any, you know, I jump around the bird quite a bit. And what that does is it keeps me constantly moving. If you notice I, when I paint, I constantly move because I, I have, to, I have to do that because I will play in it. I know that about me, I will play in it. So I move, move, move. And I don't just paint one area until it's done. I'll work around and around and around the area. So I'll jump to the bank, I'll jump to the wing, and I'll go back and forth and around. That keeps me from just playing in one area and making one color. If you play too much, you become one color and you don't want that, okay? All right. So I'll, I have a light, kind of a orangey yellow here. So I'll make, a, uh, I'll take a, some of my, take a little bit of extender here, just a little bit, some of my red right up into here. And I constantly brush mix like this. I'll find a tone right in there, nice soft tone. And what I'm looking for is that kind of fleshy type of tone right in there almost. And I'm just going to restate that right down through there, pull a little bit of that tone down onto her beak. There's a little, a little bit of that tone, but slightly lighter on the lower part of her beak right down here. So I'm going to state that in. And again, I will tend to paint too much and then take that out with some gray. And that's what gives you a, a really nice look pretty quickly. There's a dark shadow tone where her two beaks are coming together right there. So you can indicate that. And if I indicate that, I'll come back and just push out a little bit with that with that flesh tone there. And that's what helps diminish her beak down a bit. We can uh, put a little bit more gray right in there and just determine how soft I want to make that. Okay. All right. So we have that in there. Now let's go back. I, this is again, this is an important area for me is I'm going to put in my brighter little color. We want that that finch look to her, that brighter yellow to come into here. And maybe, um, but model that with a little bit of the dark. So setting that again. So now you see when you look up in here, how many different tones you're seeing in her. And that just comes from, from painting it there. I'm gonna take a little bit of that tone, just a little bit of it, and we're gonna add just a touch. And I'll, I'll usually do this if I want uh, sometimes you see on the uh, the little birds, you'll see a lot of light little little almost hairs like this up there. And I like to do that sometimes if I want to give a, a bird that has a lot of detail. So I'll come back up like this and I'll add a few of those right in here. Deanne says she is coming to life. Yeah. 
Yeah, you start to see her. She start to see her coming to life. Thanks, Deanne. <laughs> and uh, we can we can put a little bit more of a, a light maybe with that color right up in here. This is where I start to think about if I put it in one area, I'll start to put it in just a little bit slightly different area right into there. So I'll put a little bit of that right into there. This is where the, the beak feathers and the beak come together. I'll just make sure I see a little bit of color tone difference there. But remember, I'm going around, going around, going around, going around, going around. So anything I add to this bird here has to be kind of falling down this way. And I might do that here. Here you can see, look at the direction. You can see the direction, especially this one that's turned with her head looking over the shoulder. So the strokes that are very important is this direction here and then this direction here where it's, it's taken and that's what's going to make her head look like it's turned. Also one of the things which I'll talk to you about in the class is when you go draw the bird there's a little point down here it's so important it's because you got to foreshorten the bird and it's right where that point of that beak comes in. She is um, she is not foreshortened very much here. We can foreshorten just a little bit which will turn her head and you do that by putting a little bit of the light beak into the head here, just a little bit, letting a little bit of the head on the other side come back. So lots of different ways to do that. If D, you want to make her come to life a little bit more, you can tap in on the lower eye ring a little. Uh, I do this on some of them when I do a lot of detail. I'll just tap in a little bit uh, more light on the bottom eye ring. So I actually put the lightest lights a lot of times on the eye ring as opposed to putting it on the eye and you get more boom there's her eye a little bit more there so you she really comes to light when you start to do that let's uh put in just a little bit uh, more detail here a little bit more light hansi yellow and white we'll streak through that again we'll pull that down out like that we'll add a little bit of our yellow green okay let's go over here to our yellow green green that up a bit right in here and let's streak some of that out a little bit longer streaked out at that angle here pull that down and you can see those little movements now just softly feather her there we'll take some of those lightly here i'm going to widen my brush out now that i'm going to go down the body here i'm going to widen the brush out just a bit here so I can make some larger feathery strokes onto the body, some movement strokes here onto the body here. Now, one of the things we said that was really important here at the beginning is that the angle of this, because we're seeing part of her, her center lines coming here, as we go to the stroke up over here, these have got to pull this way. And that's what's going to make her look like she turns just a bit. So we have to have some of our streaks of our feathers going this way. But I'm going to keep them kind of soft here. And let's go a little bit more of our green. I'm going to go back to my darker colors here again and reset my darks. Like I say, I go back and forth and I'll paint out some of that light back and forth. And one of the lines that you're going to want to indicate here is see where the dark and the light come together. She actually has, if you want to get really detailed, she has a tan line of color right here between the yellow and the yellow green here. We won't get quite that detailed here, but I'm going to push this out like this and then curve these around that way. We'll push that down, set that into her, and then I'm going to go back. So I do it just a few times. Most of the time, three or four times, I go back and forth between the lights until I get the light that I want to have on her. I'll get a little more yellow right in there. And <clears throat> I want to get back to my kind of orangey tone middle orangey tone that I had here and restate these just a bit. So sometimes I, I take the light back out with some of that other tone and that, that'll get her a little closer 
to here, if we can get that, to what you're seeing, what's happening on her there. A little bit more dark on the top of the head there, a little bit more light into the beak. We're getting closer with that, but uh, that gets you, you there. That's about where I would... Uh, I wouldn't go any too much more detailed right now until I get some more of the of her on and I'm going to go back to uh, a, Like a number four flat here for just a little bit and I'm going to brush mix back up a Brown and I'll just do it right in here. Now one of the reasons why I do this Is so that I get all kinds of tone variations. My brown might have a, a little bit of gray in it there, a little bit of yellow, a little bit of blue into that. My brown's going to change quite a bit here. I want this just a little more black over here, maybe a little more red over here. I model that brush up like that, see? I model that color up like that, so I get some different tone into that. And we're going to come back out here like this, and we're going to start stating what the wings are going to go here. So I'm going to start first with the dark color. The wings have your primary feathers. These are the larger feathers, the primary flight feathers here. Your secondary uh, flight feathers go right into here. This She has her, her tertiary, her third area of flight feathers right in there. You have what we call on these birds, you have wing coverts. That, these are these feathers. They're going to come down like this. And a lot of times I'll take my finger and just do this. And that just gives you a really nice, real quick good look there and I'll just streak through a little bit here some of that the other feathers are folding back up over so these are going to come back up this way we'll have these the third and then the secondaries and then right down to her primaries right down here her longer primaries but sometimes when I'm when I'm painting it all depends on how much detail I want to give to the bird I will let this blur out and soften out so that your eye will come into this side more than that side there. And I'll come in and quickly state her tail at the same time here, pulling back and forth, letting some streaks. If I don't get enough streak, I just use my finger like that. And I'll set this one in on this side. Here, like that. Pull that out. and. Yeah, what I don't want to do here is I want your eye to come up in here and see her quite a bit. I don't want to go out here and make a perfect little edged filled in pattern right out here at the end of the tail because that has more interest right up here with that because it's a real dark color. So I take that off. I blur that edge. I blur that, that edge of that feather off so that uh, that, that tail feather off so that it uh, diminishes down and it won't have as much power and your eye goes right back up into to that area. So that's something to always remember. When we're artists, we're painters of edges. We've always got to watch the edge. So I'm going to put a nice edge to the front of her wing right here where I want everybody to go. I will put a nice edge to these flight feathers here. Yeah. Uh, what colors were in the, the wings again? These are the browns, okay? I make a brown from uh, basically the brown. What's your brown? And the brown is always two parts red to one part black. That's going to start your brown. And one of the reasons why I make it right up into here, because sometimes I like a little blue in it. I like a little... Um, I like a little bit of different reds and a little bit of yellow in there. But this is your base brown. And what we do in the Paint It Simply, we have some mixes that we have that we call our, our Paint It Simply base mixes. This is called base brown. It's two parts naphthol red, one part black. And then I can change that with, I, sometimes I like a little yellow into it, which changes it. Sometimes I'll add a little blue, which changes it, or a little more black, or even red violet into it changes it a little bit. And that gives you a nice set of brown to paint with. And I'll use some of that brown maybe as an undertone underneath here. And I'm just going to pull through like this and let that soften out and just push that. And you can see that original base that I put on her is still wet. That's because there's no hot air here at all. <laughs> uh -huh. and Deanne is going and Margo were going yeah right right yeah so I just soften that out and that's what I do a lot of times with the birds is that this uh, lost edge plays very nice against the found edge right up there on her and um, I like to play those against each other like that I'm going to take a little bit of that, that brownish color a little bit of yellow and then just restate just a little bit of that tone even right up in here on her 
right up in that area and pull through just a little bit. Now, you see, I get all of these nice tones and colors. You see that tone really changing from that orangey kind of tone up into the greenish tone up there. And you can add a touch or two if you want a little more contrast. This is where I like to use the just the corner of the brush. And like if you touch too much, like I did there, I'll just take some out with some yellow. Push that out there. Okay. Now we're going to come to a very important part, in it, but it goes really quite fast. Is I'm going to take some white and I'm going to tone it down with just a little bit of the brown, a little bit of my red and black here into this, tone it down, even a little bit of blue in there. Blue will make it more gray. So if we get the red, the black, and the blue in there, you'll get gray color. And that's a pretty color right there. It works pretty nice. I'm going to put this onto my brush. Now, a lot of her feathers here, a lot of her feathers have the white tips on it. A lot of finches and stuff have the white tips out here on their feathers. And I got to be real careful with these lines here. I'm probably going to soften out because they're going to pull your eye away from her face quite a bit. But I'll put some of the white down through here. So I'll start up here by the tail, co by the uh, covert, the wing coverts. And I'm not going to paint each feather exactly yet. And I'm just going to put some light right across like this. This is one, this is just one of the techniques I use on them and I, that I really like. And uh, I'll put a little bit of a, a nice covert there. Let's put one right out here. Let's drop one down this way. I don't try to paint exactly what I see in the photo. I just, because I'm also creating a painting. So I have to be careful to, you know, adjust the photo to the painting or what I want to painting. Not all photos, this is very important. Not all photos make great paintings. It's the job of the artist to see where the distracting areas are and adjust the painting, change the photo. I've got a white streak right here, which I'm going to put in, and I'll probably soften some of that out. And then I'm going to use the chisel of the brush here to put in just the idea of some soft streaks that are going to come onto those feathers. Now, along the tips of those feathers, they'll round down. So I'll just put in the round like this, here like that. Now, Just I'll ask what size brush are you using? This is a number four, and it's quite big to paint this bird in, but this this is what I use to paint birds when they're I want them to be a little bit more painterly. And I'm using it out in this area because I don't I want to keep the detail up in here. Now I'll take a little corner. See this tiny little corner of the brush here? And this is where I'm going to put some of the the uh, differences in the light feathers coming down this way. Now, one of the things that you have to decide, this is one of the things, she has a lot of them, but I'm not going to paint every single one of those. I'm going to, you know, paint like every other one of them. I'm not going to paint all of them because I want to keep this wing, which is really a lot of interest, I want to keep it a little softer. So I will come through, maybe add little touches of light color here and there through here. Okay. Now you come up to the really great part. I can use, I can drop down here to my number two, or I can use my round, but I'm going to go back to my, my brown color, and I'm going to negative paint. This is what we call negative painting out the light color. I'm just going to pull it down and lift off, and we'll you, let that light color sit as the feathers there, like that. And that's what makes your feathers. And if you lift off real kind of a brush off like that you'll get a little streaking in it but what I usually do is take my finger and come back up through it again and then restate the dark one more time to soften some of that out here I use negative painting techniques like this all the time I I love negative painting techniques now she has a lot of white but I might increase the dark on this one so that I I create uh, so I keep that white soft so it doesn't, because the white will compete up against that area there. But I will want to negative paint this out some. We'll just drag through like this, right up into that. And I'm going to negative paint from the other side in here like this to get a little bit of a angled edge to that. To all the tips that I have out here, I can negative paint right up to the tip there and get some of the, the dark and leave some of that in there, like that. Okay, I'll streak this in a little bit in here. She has some more lights right up in here, 
and I can just streak like this, just streak that up a bit in there, and then yeah. Deanne Take asks um, if you will paint the entire bird before the painting the supporting flowers. Since Sometimes, yeah. How do you determine your approach? When what you're going to do here, like this bird is not done. This detail that's right up in here is not done. I usually will paint up to about here. When I start to like it, that's when I, I move on to other areas here. And uh, so, and I'm starting to like the way she looks here. And, you know, I will uh, start to move on very quickly here, in very soon to some other areas of the painting. But you can, if she's going to control your whole painting, uh, you can go through and paint all of her first and then come back to that. So, uh, you know, there's, I like to work the whole painting as a whole. So I'm going to put a little touch of yellow into this also, right into that area there, because there is. When you look at it, and you start to see, you see there's a little touch of yellow that's going on in there. Now, if you want to add up here by the mantle here, you're going to do the same thing. If you want to put up here by the mantle area here, you want to put some light feathers that are going to come. Sometimes I just do this. I overpaint this like this, pulling down. I get a nice movement here. I'll wipe my brush, pick up a little bit of my green and stuff into my brush here, that darker color, and I'll paint down like this, leaving the little light tips to the feathers there and you get that nice little feathery look there on her you get a nice transition there and here's a lot of different techniques and a lot of different brushes i'm going to take some of this tan color because if you look you'll see just a little bit of the tan kind of color and i'm going to push that right up in here well that's got too much yellow on it let's go back to the tan color and push that right up into this area here but very soon, I matter of fact, I'll probably do it right about now. I got a little bit of negative painting over here to do. And then I'll, I'll he start heading over to the uh, flowers. We'll start setting the flowers. And then we'll set some more detail onto the bird. So it's always safest to take the bird close to what you like, not finish it, and then give yourself some room that you can add more contrast later. Yep. Did you say something? Birdie asks, uh, "Were you going? Were you able? If, sorry, were you able to stop this evening on this painting and work on it tomorrow, or do you uh, have to complete as much as possible with the acrylics?" No, you can start it right. No, you can start and work on it tomorrow. Of course, the acrylics will be dry, but you just restate a few little areas uh, again with color. Never be afraid to to uh, you know w when you're painting. Never be afraid to, to stop and go on. I'm, that's happened to me a, a number of times where I've had to stop something and come back, you know, work on it again. It just takes a little, you just put on a little more color and you're working again. Sometimes I will layer. Uh, many times I uh, paint what we call all prima. Now, what is all a prima? All a prima means you paint it in one sitting, one time through. Because today I paint one way. Tomorrow I'm going to paint different. Even though you're the same person, Have you ever, has that ever happened to you? Tomorrow you will paint different. OK, because uh, your feeling will be different. And so sometimes it's hard to catch the feeling of the painting again the next day. So artists do what we call a la prima, finishing a painting within one sitting. We try to finish it. But you can certainly do that. And you can certainly come back in and put in more color. I'm going to show you that right now with this uh, this little bird. We'll come back in and we'll put more flower colors uh, back on. OK, so it, and you can do that. There's there's no real. Um, there's no real rule to that there. So we'll we'll come in here. And now I'm going to decide here, Do how much more contrast do I want to have? We go back to our greens. Let's go back down to our greens. Still wet down here. And I'm going to take a little bit more black into this. And some black and some yellow. I'm going to make a higher contrast color here. And I'm going to push right down into here a little more contrast green right down in here that and soften that against her. This is going to start to bring her uh, more forward here, as you can see. I'll take my paper towel here. And matter of fact, I'm going to go to a, a little bit smaller brush. We'll go uh, here to a little bit smaller. It's bigger than what I've been using, my 10. This is one of my favorite, eight or a 10 is some of my favorite flower painting brushes. Because I use the smaller brush in here to give her detail, I'll use this larger brush in here now to start some of my contrast and some of my flowers that I want to uh, uh, to 
stay a little softer than she is there. So we'll start that. Let's take a little bit of browns with uh, some of my greens here. Let's pull some of that through. We're going to create some movement. Just get everything that you paint in here like this, you can take out. I'm just creating model color and I'm watching her. Now, one of the things that you want to add, she has a lot of brown. So one of the things that you want to add into the painting out here someplace is some of that brown. It could be stems. It could be anything. It could be sitting on parts of the flowers out here. It could be anything here. So we're just moving tone. That's what I do is I move tone. Don't try to be perfect about anything. Just move color around. Let's get, uh, let's put a little bit of that more blue, that other darker blue green here. A little different, little cooler green color. Let's put some of that in here. And I'm just going to move that tone around. I want this modeling a tone. Now, I don't want it out here. I want it in and around her, right into this area, because I can move that. Now, I can blur her feather edge here, which causes her to become more soft here. And I can pull some of this green up through here and just push that around a bit there. Okay. That has some, some good nice casual movement let's soften the green out i'll tone it out let's add a little red or so to tone and soften this green out we'll lighten it just a bit this takes a nice soft grayed green that will be soft against the background back here see and we can even put a little green right there by her tail let's just soften this green coming out here like that now you've really Got a lot of color movement in here. Now let's come in and uh, let's make some of our soft, warm orange colors here. This is where I love to paint. This is where I'm going to start really speeding up when I paint. And I do this speeding up because I play, like I said, I play. If I don't speed up when I paint these flowers, I'll play. Now, I want to turn the flowers in all different kinds of directions. And in the class, we'll talk about how to rock and roll flowers and how to paint roses in different directions and flowers and stuff like that. Because they do. They sit, when you look at flowers, they're going to sit in all different kinds of directions. So I want, I have her gaze going this way. So I want to capture a little bit of her gaze. And then I want to turn this flower just a bit like that. So I'm just going to pull some movement in like this, set that flower there. Let's set one right back here. Here, and I'm going to watch that I don't get this. I want that one. I got to watch that I don't get too much bright yellow. I want to watch always this area on her. I know I can go a little bit brighter on her, but I'm going to keep my yellow soft. Here, I just pick up a little green, a little red that just tones my yellow right on down, makes it a nice tertiary color, tones it right on down. And I'll softenly, softenly, that's a new word. I will softly put a little bit more color there. Put a little bit like maybe there's going to be a flower there. And I have to paint these fast. If I think about them too much, they become stiff. So I'm going to turn this flower this way. Let's even paint one that's going to be behind them. And I'll paint right into that green. And that's just going to keep everything soft there. And I'll put one out here like this. One will come out in this area. Now, before I go painting all of these others out here and, and starting to set up anymore, I have a few leaves. And sometimes I let leaves uh, be very, very casual, um, just ideas or impressions of them. So like when you look at this bird here, I don't do perfect leaves. I just do you know, color with it. That's one way into it, uh, that I set up. And then sometimes I set up perfect leaves. And I thought this would be a nice contrast here is if I stroke in or set in the leaf shape out here, a couple of leaves that will just, that actually set the gaze coming out this way a little bit. And I'll just take some of this medium green here and set some of these coming in this way. I'll add more to it later, but coming out to the outside edge of your design and setting a few leaves, uh, actually it adds a little bit of a different contrast from a real soft area, muddled area, to a little bit more of a definition. I can change the whole feeling of this area right up here 
by just adding a couple of, a little bit more shaped leaves right in there like that. I will set that direction. Now that also brings it forward. So you have to be careful. So sometimes I take my finger like this and just take off the edge. I'm always watching whenever I put something out there, I'm always watching the reaction of what is it doing to the bird here. That's the most important part. Let's pick up some white. Let's come right down into here. Now we've got to, again, we've got to be a little careful. We're going to pick up some white. I'm just going to streak this right in from the edge here. These little, these, uh, these are little uh, shrub roses here. So they have white right out onto the tip of them there. I can push in and out with my finger to get a little bit of that movement. And remember, I want to keep these kind of soft. So I like to push in and out with my finger and drag color back and forth. And I'm an artist. I used to paint flowers with a lot of strokes. Now I paint flowers for movement. So all I'm interested in is putting some light and just moving my finger like this to move that flower in there. I'd rather do it with my finger than do it with the, uh, with the brush because the finger keeps it softer. The finger here keeps that softer. Yeah, just like that. And let's uh, put a little light one that's going to come right in here. We'll let this one sit below these. So we'll just put in a little bit of light for right now. It's just going to be back behind there. Let's change the tone up a bit. Matter of fact, let's add just a touch more yellow, a little bit lighter and brighter. Let's put the edge of this one here. So that'll pull her. I'll watch that. It might pull away from her a bit too much. And then, you know, we'll talk about this in the class about rocking and rolling flowers. But to turn a flower like this, I've got to do more of an oval shape. And I'm going to just move my finger like that and just push that color in and out like that. We don't want to do a flat flower here. That would be less interest. So let's just put a little color out like this here. That just suggests the petals there. Let's turn some petals up. So this time I'll put the light up to the inside, stroking down like that. And that will turn this, this little flower this way. And then let's just create that movement, that soft movement there. And that'll help turn that flower. Matter of fact, let's turn this one as well. So the light color goes up, pulling down, and that will turn that flower there. A little bit of light here into the back coming out here like that okay and let's just paint impressionistically out here with some of these others this is all I do is I don't need to paint flowers out here I just need to move the color here just need to move the color and let the viewer start to see flowers here so <clears throat> let's get um, now it, in the original, you know, in the shrub roses and this stuff, they'll be pretty bright yellow. But I'm painting these in conjunction with her, so I don't. I can brighten up a little bit, but I I really don't want to go brighter than what's what you see on her. So now I'm adding just a little more yellow, a little bit more of a yellow tone, bringing the flower up just a bit more here, in like that. It's nice. And I do just love to paint with this big tin, this big soft fusion brush tin. Just does a really nice job of just carrying that color through. A synthetic just digs into the color too much. The fusion glides on the top. Does a nice job of depositing a lot of paint. And I'm painting with a lot of paint right now. Here we go into that. We have orange, kind of orange browns into the centers here. So let's get some brown. You're just busy typing away over there. You're talking to these people there? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. You guys don't need me. You're all okay. <laughs> uh, you're getting uh, uh, just gorgeous. Oh. It's magic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I like. Well, you know, you can you can uh, go ahead and say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And if you guys want to type some more of that, that's awesome too. <laughs> I'm going to take some yellowy brown color here and we'll set... Notice how carefully I apply it here. Okay, we'll set some ideas in and out here like this. And see, it's that in and out. I paint for movement. You know, I, I don't paint perfect. I paint for movement here, and I'll set that in and out. If I want more contrast up in these center flowers here, I'll put a little bit more dark 
and movement here. That's, I want your eye to come into here. So, and I've got to get some of these brown, some of these uh, colors, even though in the original shrub roses, the the uh, canary bird uh, shrub roses here, you'll see more of an orange. I may go to more of a brown that you'll find uh, inside of her there. So uh, that, you know, it's it's an artist call, what you might want to do. I might want to break this up right here and put the idea that there's a yellow one right back behind there as well. And I'm just painting for movement right now. Let's lighten up and brighten up just a bit more. We'll start looking for some of our front contrast. Push in and out. And if the flower is, um, if the flower is going to be scooping or something like that, then you would just scoop the flower like this. That movement there. So sometimes I do that um, onto there. But these flowers are painted in conjunction with this um, with the bird. And so when I paint flowers shrub roses or something they have a little hey jay can you go upstairs and get the red the shrub roses from um the uh, um study of flowers that's right by the door out there with the cups yeah with the cup the red ones the pink reds pink ones don't say anything jessica's going upstairs for a second so I'll just add some of those edges in there. And if this one's going to be back here, I'll add maybe an idea that there's an edge of one back in here. Just the movement of those petals right in there. That's all you want to do. And on some flower paintings, I just push in a lot of a color like this and give the idea that other, other movements here like this. And so your eye will just see those lights and stuff. It's just other bits of movement there. Yep, that's one. That's the one. So these flowers are being painted in conjunction with the bird. The bird is more important. So these flowers that I paint here into this one here, there is no bird. These flowers are standing all on their own here. And so um, this is uh, something that I put a lot of contrast and this is how I cup them. You can see the cup movement here, but I paint these with a lot of little touches of the color, push it around a little bit. So there's a lot more detail and color and you can see the contrast sitting here and getting softer as it goes out through here. But I'm not going to put that much detail into these flowers because I will, I will lose the bird here in, in all of these flowers. The flowers will compete against the bird. But if you don't paint birds very well, maybe you want that to happen. I don't know. But I will put a little bit more light here. The other thing is that uh, sometimes into these flowers, I'm going to reach back all the way back to my background color, which was my blue and my red here. And really taking it almost a little bit more purpley here. But I want to create a real light, my sky color here. Keep it kind of light. And I like to do this. Now, this is where if you're using a cheaper acrylic, you will get muddy color because you're using a color that is very much a, almost a complement to it. But if you're using a high-grade painting acrylic, you get just a beautiful little touch of that blue right there, right inside of that, right inside of that flower right there like that. And then that's going to, we're going to start adding just little touches of this blue color through that's going to carry our background up and into our design and it also to me any time you start to add sky and always remember this people always this is this is very fun whenever you add the sky if the sky is there you add a lightness and airiness to the painting so if i take this blue color like this and i just start to suggest it even back down into some of the areas back down into here i'm taking the sky back into the painting and many times in a painting I will come back in just with sky color and start pushing it into the painting. To, it makes it more airy, more light. You're pushing the, pushing some of the heaviness of just pure color back out. And it doesn't have to be pure sky. It can be all kinds of, it can be a little bit different. Here, while I'm doing that, I'm going to take a little bit of this. I have to make sure I go up and down, but kind of, this is where I start to look at the bird and I'll clean up here against the edge of the bird. And for, for a long time, I didn't do this. And I started doing this a few years ago, and I really liked it. Coming back in with just real heavy paint, 
cleaning up against the edge of the bird and really making a nice area right like that right where that bird is that really brings her head forward here in this and I'll model that just a bit there but that really starts bringing her more forward here and I can make it as light that's a little too light so I'll just blue that up a bit but I like that little bit of color. Yeah, Jay, you look like you have a question. <laughs> well, Tabitha asks, yes. um, Hi, Tabitha. How, how or where did you learn to paint? <laughs> how or where did I learn to paint? I actually started painting when I was uh, in high school. My mother, Josanya, of course, is a famous artist. and um, But I didn't really like too much of what she painted. So I started following a guy on PBS, uh, uh, William Alexander and I started back in the 70s started following his mountains and everything like that and then that really got me excited of painting and then I finally went to my mom and asked her for a few lessons and started falling in love with rose mauling back by the end of the 70s and then uh, yeah that's where I started and then I painted all just about everything from ships to rose mauling to scrolls to acanthus to I've done so many different things. If it's, you know, if it sits still long enough, I'll paint it. That's where I think is. I, I love painting everything. But as I start doing so many other things, I, you know, I love now my goal is I, I love the decorative arts, but I love the arts themselves as well. See, I'll put a little blue back here. See how that opens up, just that starts to open up the feeling of the design a bit. Um, but I love the decorative arts, but I love the arts and I love some of the lost and found edges, and I want to bring that back into the decorative painting arts a little bit more because we don't do that quite enough in the decorative arts. So that's my goal now. Tabitha says you're one of her favorite artists ever. You're oh, a big, thank a you big very fan. much. Thank you very much, Tabitha. I appreciate that. Okay. Birdie asks, is MDF panel a brand name, or is it like yeah. Masonite? Yeah, no, it's you can use Masonite. You can use what we call tempered Masonite. You can use that um, as that, and you can get that for like about eight dollars a sheet or so at some of your home stores. Um, a I big used sheet. to, yeah, it's, yeah, big sheet, four by eight sheet, and you can have them cut it down for you. Sometimes they'll they'll squawk at you, but some guys will do it for like twenty five cents a cut or something like that. I'm going to put just a little brown, more brown into some of these in here. And um, so the, you can get that. Uh, I use, these are super MDF panels and, you know, they, they're, they're this color when they're natural. And uh, we get it in a big sheet and it runs about the same type of, of price, but it's, uh, they're lightweight. And this is the super MDF, which the older MDFs used a lot of resins and stuff that, uh, uh, tended to be a little bit toxic, and so the Super MBFs don't use those resins, so that's what we use now. Now I'm going to do just like I do here with this. Now, I, I'm a firm believer, if you use negative painting in her, like up in here, you should use negative painting into your somewhere into your design as well. So I'll use some negative painting up into, like around my center of interest flowers here, just to pop them out just a little bit more. So I'm a firm believer in what you do, some of the techniques you use on her, you should use into your, um, into your flowers and stuff as well here. So we'll come in and we'll use a little bit of this and you can see how that pops the, the contrast. If I really want to pop this petal out right here, I just come right along the edge with that nice contrast dark and I'll negative paint. So I actually, it's a lot easier, well, I don't do this with all flowers, but with some flowers, one of the techniques I use is to keep it real blurry here and then I'll negative paint to paint the shape of that petal that I want that flower to have there like that. So it's a, so it, it's much, to me, it's much prettier to keep it, the petal movement very soft and then use the background. And it's, this is a type of technique when I started, I, how did I learn to do this? I started doing this a lot when I started painting porcelain. Porcelain painters do this. They do a lot of negative painting. So let's take a little bit more brown and uh, colors here, some browns and some blacks here with this. And we'll just put in a, a few more little colors of the stems and stuff through. This is where I'll, I'm going to lighten that up just a bit, a little bit more yellow here. 
and I'm going to start pulling some lines of these browns and the brownish yellow. And part of this is these are some of the tones that you're going to see on her. See that tone? That, that tone right there, that's some of the tone that you're going to see on her right up in here. And that's going to take some of this tone out into the painting again. And that will uh, add some, again, some more color carrying interest in there. I'll add a touch of that in there. And we go into that right there. That's pretty good. That works well. We'll add a little bit more, maybe a touch of a reddish tone into some of those flower centers. Not too heavy of the red because I don't, I don't want to identify red too much because I don't have it very much in a painting. And to do the centers, of course, there's all different kinds of ways to do centers. In the shrub roses a lot, many times you'll find the centers done with the darks and stuff. But on this one here, I'm just going to take some, I'm going to take the corner of my brush, pick up a little Hansa yellow and some white, just model it. Don't mix it. So sometimes it'll come off a little bit brighter and sometimes a little bit darker. And we'll just kind of tap that right around that flower there like that. Let's tap a little bit into this one. Now this one will want a little softer, so what I do is I just hit it with my finger here. I use magic finger there. And we'll put this one in there. So I tap a little bit more and then a little bit around it like that. Teresa in uh, Canada asks yeah. if this type of painting would work on a canvas. Absolutely, I do it on canvas all the time, Teresa. As a matter of fact, I sell a lot of canvases with these uh, these types of paintings done. I use the panel uh, like this uh, just be, and it, it's like when I, uh, one of the reasons why I use a panel as opposed to canvas. I do paint these on canvas, but with the, and when I paint on canvas, I like to uh, cover with small paintings. I like to, to cover um, with the canvas, a piece of wood with the canvas, because I do a lot of pushing uh, when I paint, and I don't like the springiness that a canvas gets you. So I, I, uh, I love painting on a wood panel. But yeah, you, I paint on canvases and stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a lot of a lot of paintings done on canvas. There is a bit of discussion about uh, types of surface and different types of wood to paint yeah. on. Do you yeah. have a? If you weren't using MDF, is there another type of wood you recommend? I'd use masonite or something like that. The problem with the problem with um, if you are um, using wood grains, like say, say you're going to use a pine or something like that, and it's one of the things I just filmed in the Cinderella class. We had a, I had a discussion in there about uh, pine. Uh, pine uh, and propylene glycol don't really like each other, and it can raise the grain after a matter of time, even through a good ceiling and stuff. So um, pines are, you know, heavy grain wood, a ponderosa pine and stuff, you'd have some problem with. The reason why I like the MDF is you can, you can put on as much mediums and stuff as you want, and you won't interfere with the... Um, with the uh, grain of the wood, raising the grain of the wood. That's the big thing. So you can actually paint on any type of wood that you want, but just remember if a wood is heavy grain, that's gonna interfere with your ability to do a lot of detail work. So make sure that you prep it, you know, smooth it out and sand it and prep it a few times. Like when I painted the, the uh, um, uh, in one of the DVD releases we have is this Cinderella that I did back here. Let me go grab this real quick here. And this is done on a uh, a beautiful pine piece of uh, pine here. Let me go back to this camera here. This is done on a, a beautiful piece of pine, and they have a lot of um, there's a lot of detail that I put into the painting here, and on this pine and on this this is a triptych here, and uh, because there's a lot of detail and it's pine and it's a heavy grained wood, I base coated it a couple of times, sanding in between, so I can get the surface absolutely smooth, because I have that detail. Any kind of grain or anything like that, that. Um, you put inside or you know if you're working on a, a wood surface any type of grain that you have is going to get worse after layers and layers and layers of color because grain uh, gets lifted and so you want to be a little bit careful about that so there's that flower there now this light color that i'm just using here i'm going to come over and i'm going to restate that, some of that right up here on her in her breast area and that'll be a nice transitional tone here to go up here 
to up towards her face and stuff like that. Let's go back down to a little smaller brush here. And uh, we'll come in a little closer so we have some of those flowers done and we can uh, do a little bit more there. But uh, we'll put uh, come in with a little bit more light here. Build that up on her uh, into the, the light transition here. Sometimes I like to push this in a little bit more into this area. So now I'm going to come in and keying off the flowers, make sure that she has a little more interest into the flowers than uh, or interest into her than what we find onto the flowers here. So I'm going to key that light up there like that. I might uh, hit this right up into the yellow again just like that and then restate my yellow and my yellow right in here is a little sticky and that's good that's what I want I can set this other brighter yellow right up on top of that right there without a problem and I can use uh, just a little edge and put in like little other little draggy feathers here right into there like that Start just a, a little bit more detail on here. So, Deanne, you can start, you know, you can go back and forth. You could have done this on the bird right away, or I like to go out and paint the feathers. I mean, go out and paint the flowers and then come back and do a little bit more feathering on her, a little bit more transitional tones that I'll have. I'll put some right into here, transition that light here. This is where I stop now looking at the photo. And I start painting what I think she needs to have some more interest. So I'm not looking at the photo anymore because I don't want to copy the photo. I know pretty much where she's going to go. And I'll start uh, looking at the painting as to what I want to, uh, to put on her. And I'll take a bit of that light. Let's add just a touch of that around her right up in there. Looks pretty good. You can, if you get too much, again, same thing. If you get too much, just put a little dark into your brush and push back out and re and negative paint out some of that. Or I like to push back and forth a bit and let those colors just override each other like that. And that works really well. Her, now, you see, this is some things you got to, let's take a look here. Here, the beak on this one is dark. This one is lighter. You have to kind of decide what you're going to want. Um, on her, I'm going to decide I'm going to have a little bit more light right up onto her beak right here. But I'm going to leave a little dark up at the top that will contrast against the blue. I'm painting a painting now. Now I'm switching my mind over to painting a painting and looking for contrast. We can put a little shine right up there. Um, and we can put a little lower light right down at the bottom there, another little tone. So that gets just a little more interest into her. Do I want to put a, a tiny little hit of light on the eye ring right up along the top of the eye that would pop her eye just a little bit more? These are things I start to do. We'll talk about all of this in the class and we'll talk about the uh, all different kinds of ways what I'm looking at, but to show you some fun things right now. And I can negative paint back some of my feathers, my feathers that are through here. I can negative paint anything back up in this area that I want. One of the things I like to do, and I do it in several of my DVDs, all, all of my paintings, it's kind of like one of my little signatures. And you see it here, this bird doesn't have it. This one does. The little feathers that cross over the top of the wing there like that. I love to do that. And so I'm going to take a little bit of my yellow and light with just my small round brush, and I'm just going to drag right like this. A little bit of the feathers and this like this is right where the, the wing comes into the body here and I'll just state it again with a little bit of light I like to put that in as a little interest and it just kind of incorporates her wing into the body there and maybe a few touches up the up the of that light just so that light isn't sitting there by itself just a few little touches of that in other parts here and we can go right up here by the top, up into this area. Right up there. And put a little bit of that right in there. Um, any of your, uh, 
any colors that you might want to restate this is where I you know I might want to restate that a little bit of that brown right in there those are fun little colors to just put in and that gets a, a bit more you know detail to her now how much more do you do out here onto onto that that's that's your call you know I might take part of her wing here and restate a little bit more light right up on maybe this edge of the wing pulling in like this and I don't do the whole wing because I that would bring it all forward but I'll do just a little bit of it here and create a little more contrast right in this area of the wing here so it pulls a little more light right to there we'll streak that back up just a touch there like that isn't this this little fusion brush I'm always amazed just how well it paints feathers it just does it it's this that synthetic squirrel is just amazing there we go just like that so it puts in a little more detail I'm gonna let these be soft right out through there like that and uh, so that gets the bird kind of where I want to have it and now I'll just add some final little accents around the design and some other leaves. We'll work on our final leaves and I'll balance it against the bird. Yeah, you have a question. Quick question about um, prepping. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick, who has uh, been really um, offered a lot of good insights in the comments, uh -huh. has asking if gessoing is the same as base coating. Nope. Gessoing is, well, first off, um, unless you're using a new generation gesso, I wouldn't do it. Gesso is old, old, old world painting. Um, we used to do it back in the 70s when I painted there. But uh, new generation paints are so far beyond gesso. There's a lot of people that use it. That's just because that's always been the way that they have painted. But um, gessos really are not... Um, they're water soluble, so you have to be careful um, with them in the, into a painting. We used to use we used to use them as grounds, what we call ground, the ground and, and base coat something, um, just because they were cheap and they worked, and uh, you had to put a lot of them on when we used um, canvas to fill up the the weave of the canvas or the wood grain if we were decorative painting painting on on surfaces like that. But they're not a good sealer. They're not a good sealer at all. They don't seal the surface off at all. They are permeable, and uh, which means they'll absorb. They'll still absorb water, and it can be quite quite hazardous. I mean, the old style gessos. People use them today. That's because so because they've always done it. But you use a good sealer or good primer. We have a sealer and a primer that is a hundred times more effective, and uh, than gesso is. I, I would shy away from gesso completely. As a matter of fact, I haven't, I haven't used it in probably 30 years. I haven't used it on anything. So you have to be careful. Now I'm just adding a few other little things on there. But there's a lot of people that use it, and they use it, and you ask them why. Well, that's because it's a belief, you know, because art goes back for such a long, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. There's a belief that you need to get it gesso, but they don't know why. Well, the gesso was there as a ground. And originally, gesso was created, believe it or not, but gesso was created um, to stop. It was an acry acrylic gesso so that you can paint right on top of wood grain, um, wood panels. And the old Dutch back in the um, you know, 16th and 17th century, the Dutch masters and stuff that did a lot of painting on oak panels and everything, you would have a reaction between um, oils, oils and uh, the wood, the tannin that's inside the wood called saponification, which is the, the process that we use for making soap. But what that would do would crack the paint. Okay, and so if you, you were an oil painter, we'd always put down layers and layers and layers of gesso to block between the wood and the oil paint so you didn't get a process called saponification. Now, a lot of people, unless you're a paint maker like what we are, you don't know why you did it. You just, that's just what you the, your teacher told you to do and you carried on and you did that. But if you're using a, acrylic like this, you don't have to worry about saponification because the the acrylics don't react with the tannin and wood and all that kind of stuff. So we have sealers and everything like that that we have and processes that we have. But you you know, gesso is that's old world. And you know, we can I would use a sealer. If you're an oil painter, I'd use a sealer going right into the oils. Um 
you know, first. I wouldn't use gesso. Matter of fact, I, I did some consulting uh, a few years ago from a uh, in the uh, world champion uh, decoy carvers. Now, some of these decoys were, you know, twenty and thirty thousand dollars are beautiful birds. And this one guy, part of the competition is the bird. Uh, this beautiful painted carved decoy has to float in the tank. And this guy floated his decoy in, and uh, all the paint came off. And he asked me why, and I asked him, I said, did you use gesso into the prepping of that bird? And he said, yeah. I said, what happened was your paint gesso, the water layer went right through your paint down in and hit the gesso, and the gesso reconstituted and came off. So, yeah, you have to be careful sometimes. Now, I'm just going to put a few lighter yellow green here. We'll finish it off here with just a maybe a lighter yellow green. Maybe even get some of that blue and the yeah and some of the yellow here i like that color and we'll brighten that up a bit so are they still talking to you jay oh yes yeah okay and we'll put a, a leaf or two right up in here in the center we're going to let this come right over her and that will sink her into the painting that will push her back into the painting a little bit more. So this flower, that will give somewhere you, you know, a lot of times in the arts, and we'll talk about this in the class quite a bit as you're setting up your composition, because I want to have an entire class on drawing compositions. But um, we, one of the things that you do as an artist when you're setting a composition is you look for overlapping planes lines that can overlap each other so when i overlap her with this leaf that pushed her back and brought this flower forward and so that's some of the stuff that i look for especially as i'm around here into the center of interest here now i'll darken it down gray it down just a bit we'll come out here and add just a little softer version of that color i might pump that up with a little more yellow here first and just hit the edges of that you can see i just pull in what i imagine is a center vein line here and I just pull in lightly to that. I'm a painter of movement. I'm not a painter of strokes. I, well, when I decorative paint, I'm a painter of strokes. But when I paint like this, I'm a painter of movement. It's actually, if you can just get yourself to stop stroking, which is hard, it's actually easier to paint this way. You just paint the movement in, model the colors. We call this modeling the colors. So when I'm looking at a color like this, I'm doing this. You can see, I, I when, especially when I'm coming with my highlights, I don't blend it in. I do what we call model it in. I model it in so my brush, you'll see light color and dark color on that brush like that, okay? And then I'll just pull that in here and I'll get that streak. See the streaks of the lights and the darks there? And I can wipe my brush if I want to bring that shadow out. I just pinch wipe my brush like this and I can pull it out a little bit, pull the shadow in or I'll paint back and forth a few times to get the color that I want there. I can take a little bit of that. Let's put just a little bit of the light on this side, just pull in a bit. So now we have a nice light little side to it there, going in right into that one there. Let's put some of that in. That's kind of pretty there. Now another color, uh, you know, when you're talking about colors, you know, she. You know, you're looking at, you're trying to finalize, you know, I mean, how much more do you want to do on her? How much more color do you want to do on her? Um, you know, what else could you do on her, too, is one of the things that you might be asking to get more interest and stuff. You always have your complement color that you can go to, or a version of your complement color that adds. Now, I added some of the blue in. I can restate some of that blue back up into a few areas. That would be nice. But you also have, because she's heavy into the yellows, you can always reach a little bit more towards the violets. So let's just take some of our violet right up in here. And I love, I, this is a color that you have to be a little careful with because you can... Uh, you know, you can overdo it very, very quickly. But this is red violet with the white, quite a bit of white, lightened up quite a bit here. Okay. And, uh, and I'm going to take this as an accent tone now through the painting. And very soft, but it'll add quite a bit to the painting here. Makes it more painterly here. Just adds another little tone into the painting here. And why it, why it works is it's a complement to the, and you can use it anywhere. You can use it on edges of leaves here. You can pull some of that through the, through 
through the painting here, just little touches through. And you can even like come like on her back here and hit a few little touches of the violet might hit. Just, just to give her a little more of a color there, like that, sitting like that, see? And um, little accent. You think about accents and colors coming around. And again, it just gives uh, the eye a little bit more of a colorful experience here. Which is what you might want to do. Let's lighten this up a bit more. Look for your planes. Make sure stuff sits back so it comes forward. And uh, you know, put a light edge there with that one. We'll put a little bit more defined leaf here. You can use the chisel like this and suggest a little stem that goes between stuff. Do you have a question? Birdie asks. Uh -huh. uh, Hi, Birdie again. <laughs> <laughs> the people who are painters of light, is uh -huh. it a matter of many, many layers and yes. playing with the tones? Or what about glazes? There's no need for them here, but do you have any comment on using glazes in your paintings? Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, see that big, uh, that, uh, well, let me go switch that camera so you can see that big one back there. Um, that big Dutch piece back there is painted with layers and layers and layers of, you know, thin applications of paint. That's the Dutch paint. Start out with a grisaille and then paint um, with layers of, of glazes. And there's a lot of detail in this painting. Let me bring it up here under the monitor. Some of you hasn't seen Let me show you this, uh, like this uh, tulip here. Let me switch back to this camera again. We'll try to get it underneath there. You can see there's a lot of details and stuff that, that go into a painting like this. And this one is painted with layers and layers and layers of uh, glazes. Did that show up okay? Uh, yeah, there it is. Yes, yeah. there it is. Yeah, okay. It's painted with layers and layers and layers of glazes here, starting out with a grisaille underneath and then a lot of layers of glaze. So all of these uh, these small, tiny little grapes that we have up here, those are layers and stuff of glazes. So there are uh, some techniques uh, that I do. Um, well, it, it, that I do a, a lot of. Thanks, Jay. Hey, Jay, say hi while you're there, so they hi. see your face. <laughs> hi. <laughs> okay. So there's a lot of techniques that we do that um, I, I do use. You know the uh, the glazes and stuff. You could come back with a painting like this and you could do a little glazes. We call them after glazing. Um, you know, you can go in and, and but usually you use them for shadows or something like that. But you can put some, um, you know, put some into like this tint, like this, this uh, violet here. Let me take this. So like this violet and stuff color. Let me see. Now you see, you look at the, the flowers up there up close. See the violets and colors that come through there. You see the violets and everything hitting on her just a bit there. Um, and that, that works, you know, that, you know, how much you want to add to it and tint through, you know, that's up to you. I see I didn't finish a flower up here into the uh, very back. I should take a little soft yellow and tap a little bit of that back into there just to get a little movement. Not make a perfect center. It's a back flower. So just tap a little color back into that right there. Just kind of, just to say you did it and tap it out there a little bit. And you can put more interest in if you want. You can put more negative painting in. You can put more edges to her feathers if you want. You know, that's all up to you if you want more contrast. Now it's a it's a matter of how contrast you want to paint. So when you look at the, this guy here, I put a lot of interest into his, into his feathering. You can see up into his face and everything there. How much that I did, you know, in the detailing and stuff up into him. He was kind of fun to paint. He was uh, uh, very different for me to... Uh, to paint. Um, can I have that fly catcher that's right over there, Jay? The fly catcher. I have so yeah. many birds around here. It's uh, that no, it's right back there. The one on the panel there. That one. There's a couple of right there on the box. In the box. Oh, bring those other ones too. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, bring more birds. Catcher. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the fly catcher. Yeah. So, and we have a lot of paintings uh, and stuff that we're going to do, but. Out of the first uh, book here, um, I did the flycatcher, and this one I wanted him his wings a little bit more realistically, so I worked on his wings. And this is a canvas board. This I painted him on a canvas board here, and which I put a a, a nice coat of a sealer and then some texture medium on it to flatten it out a little bit here. Uh, before I did it. And some of the cardinals, we're going to be working on a cardinal here. That's a female cardinal and the male cardinal. 
We're going to be painting those here starting this next week. This is a little Kirkland's Wobbler with the bee that we're going to be doing there. And I love this canvas back chickadee. It's the one we're going to do here. So you'll see um, uh, with this guy here, if I can, uh, there it is, find my controller here. You'll see there's a lot of, well, that's a little too close for that camera. There, there's a lot of detailing that's done in here with this one. And I did, I painted him mostly with a number two flat that's giving you this kind of detailing and working in there like that with him. But then you got to keep the flowers here. He's playing with some roses here. You got to keep them softer than him. So there's a lot of different uh, types of um, techniques and stuff that we're going to do and we're going to paint with. Yeah. Uh, Dixie asks about finishing the piece. What kind of sealer do you put on top? I use a varnish. I use, I, we have a varnish, um, Matter of fact, I have it right up there. It's Dave's Mix. It's uh, what I use is we have a mat and then we have a gloss and I use them one to one together. And uh, then I just give a, a coat to that. I don't have to put on with older varnishes that we made in the 90s and stuff. We had a problem uh, with being able to put it on. Sometimes they would lift the color because we had to put a solvent inside of that. And uh, sometimes it would lift the color. So we came out with uh, techniques like put down a coat of clear glaze medium first or put down a coat of sealer first, which didn't have that solvent inside that varnish. Uh, with today's newer generation varnishes, you can just go right directly on and paint it. You don't have to do that. Some people still like to put on a sealer and a glaze, but I use the heritage varnish. I use one part. I like a nice satin finish. That is what I put on my, uh, that's what I put on my paintings here. So it's not, it's not a, uh, a real high gloss. Let's show that here. It's not a super shine gloss, but it's a, it's a little bit more of a satin, but it brings up, if you get a little bit more to the satin, it'll bring colors up a little bit more. Um, and that is, I make that by one part gloss and one part uh, matte. And I like to um, to do that to control. If I want something more matte, I increase matte or, or that. But you can go just directly after this painting is dry. Matter of fact, you can go put this under the hair dryer. And as soon as it's dry and cooled down, you can varnish it. Okay, we used to have to wait 24 hours. You don't have to do that. You just have to make sure it's dry. Yep. Birdie. You look like you have another question. <laughs> <laughs> Birdie asks, do these paints fade in the sunlight when you nope. hang them? Nope. These are all ASTM class, which is American Standard of Trade Materials, class one uh, pigments. They will never fade for the life of that piece. As long as that piece is around, it's all there. So they've been age tested to over 200 years and there's no fading whatsoever. But they're all certified pigments, ASTM class one, which is the highest quality. I won't use any other class pigments. I've been making paints for companies for a long time. I won't recommend any other pigment that is, a, you know, is a, you know, you might use a, a, a two or something like that. That, uh, an ASTM class 2 pigment. You can use an ASTM class 2 pigment in our system here because the binding system actually gives a, um, uh, we have um, uh, a protective agent in there that protects it against UV, which is UV protectant. Okay. And as a matter of fact, uh, in Taiwan, they were doing a lot of decoupage with our products. So we added a UV protectant to our sealer. So if they're using low grade pitchers or something like that, um, they can put use our, our sealer on that and that will protect those inks from fading. So, uh, you know, some of our products will have a, a protectant, UV protectant in it, like the sealer. We've added it to the varnish as well, but it's not necessary. It's, uh, we only did that because they use products for other things. It's not necessary for our paints. Our paints are all ASTM class one, high grade artist quality pigments that will never fade on. You can put them right in the sun and you can put them right outside. They're all certified for outside. As a matter of fact, the binding agent that we use within this paint is a newer generation one they came out with in 2005 and it is a uh, concrete sealant so it's really made for going outside but we use it in the artist quality here and they stay wet for a long time the other thing is like notice right up here it's it's starting to dry right up through here we've also added a, it to the paints an emulsifying agent to it and I got a letter from an artist up in uh, Canada the other day and is asking me about that he says you know, for about an, uh, for a couple hours on your paint, if you just come back and, and spritz it like this onto the surface like that with a little bit of water, you can come back and reconstitute that whole paint right there again and use it again. Now that you can do for about for a couple of hours after uh, after a couple of hours. Well, you didn't see that, did you? I forgot to switch the camera back. Sorry. Just a minute. 
So I was going to show you here. So some of these areas that out here that uh, got a little bit dry, I just did it to this one here that was real dry. I'm trying to find an area that's a little bit more dry. Or like this yellow up here, this cakey yellow is a little bit dry up there. You just mist it with a little bit of water. The water will reactivate the color and you can mix it right back up there again. So it's it's got a what we call an emulsifier within the paint. Uh, this is why we can use it on watercolor and stuff like that too. But we put that um, into the paint so that um, we get a, a that stays wetter longer and you can control that. So Mr. Bottle's a nice thing to have around your palette all the time. If your palette ever starts to dry up on you and all that kind of stuff, just mist it lightly and everything will come back to work together. And I've uh, just finished a couple of big commission pieces where I paint with a lot of the global color. And when my global color was starting to dry up, rather than add it more extender, I just misted the palette with some, ext uh, with some mint water and that worked wonderful and I love that, it worked great. You look like you have another question. <laughs> yeah. Um, Patrick asks if the matte is partially opaque, like in some brands. Nope. Nope. Uh -uh. We just have a little bit uh, of, a, I think it's like a, a 8 or 10% degaussing agent in it. And so it's not it's not completely opaque. You can put it right on to, to black and there would be no problem. As with, uh, you know, a lot of people think, you know, they there's a lot of misconceptions about varnishing. I have some videos on the, the websites and stuff that you can watch on where I show you about varnishes. And I'll teach you a little bit of the chemistry behind the varnishes. Um, but uh, we put a bunch, a varnish is what we call, it's an unstable emulsion, and especially in the older ones. There's a bunch of stuff together that don't like to mix, like oil and vinegar, making a salad dressing. And you really got to shake that thing up because there's what are called defoamers in there and everything else. And the lightest thing, defoamers keep bubbles from forming. And the lightest weight material in that emulsion is the defoamer, and it'll go right to the top. Now, some people say, don't do that. Just lightly roll the bottle, never shake it up because it give bubbles. No. If you don't shake it up, you don't mix up the defoamer, and then you first squirt it out, you squirt out all your defoamer, then you get bubbles from then on. So um, there's a lot of misconceptions I read out on the website all the time. Best thing to do is always write to the company that's making your products, write to the chemist if you can that's making your products, and uh, you know ask them those those particular types of questions. But uh, I, I read on all these forums, all these help forums out there that people, you know, help me with this, help me with that. And I see so much disinformation out there. So be kind of careful. But varnishes are emulsions and should be shaken up, um, you know, just like uh, you see in so many paint cans, all that kind of stuff. When you get them, they say shake before using. That's very true because they're unstable emulsions. Right, Jay? Yes. Yes, Jay. <laughs> okay. Are they finishing up? I think so. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I hope you hope I hope you enjoyed that. Let's take one last look at that. She can go, yay, Dave. Okay, there you go. There's a little bit. You can put in more or more detail and stuff like that. But I like overall the painting on her. It's a little bit uh, a little bit softer. I might bring up this this edge of the wing a little bit more. I'll decide on that. Um, here as I go. There's all kinds of different ways. As I say in the um, the class and stuff was it, some of the pieces that I have up in the class that, that that's coming up on. Been really, really excited. Oh, I love this little bush tit too. That's out of the book. I, lo I just love this one here. Um, and if you're interested in that, that one's in, like I said, in the book. We have, I have three volumes of the books, and I use different kinds of techniques into those volumes. That little bush tit that's here, she's in the back. And each one of these have a, a lot of step photos through it, where we're talking, you know, a lot of the. Uh, um, the, the steps so you see the painting of the flowers and you see the painting of the little bush tit how I start her out and how I go through and um, all the little details here I'm using the flat and the thing just like I use with you there there's a whole front section you know of, of this book here that um, uh, we'll go to the front and talks about color color mixing and everything they're great little books and I talked about feathering techniques, different ways to negative painting and stuff. And we'll talk about drawing and sketching, setting up bird compositions and stuff. And then here's one of the most important things that we got the different parts of the, like I said, the, the, the mantle and all that kind of stuff and the coverts and everything, learning those. And it's a lot easier to, um, it's a lot easier to paint a bird if you learn just a little bit of the parts of the bird because then you know to put those in there and stuff. But uh, we have all kinds of, 
all kinds of stuff. So we have books and we have videos. We have a lot, I have a lot of YouTube. There's a Kingbird. Those of you that are just new to this, there's a Kingbird that we put up last month onto the YouTube, onto the, the uh, this channel, onto David's channel. There, where I painted Kingbird. So if you want to go watch that one too, the live broadcast here will go back up onto YouTube. Um, what we'll do is we'll run a few minutes here of the DVR. What what we'll do is we'll run an exit stream here. Um, you ought to watch the exit stream too. Jessica made that and it's really nice. You'll watch me paint another bird. Say thank you, David. <laughs> thank you, Daddy. <laughs> thank you, Daddy. <laughs> yeah. There's there's an exit stream um, there that's coming up and you can see me paint the, uh, the little hummingbird and stuff. But uh, then that gives you time at the very bottom here. We've set this so that you have a DVR. So you ha you'll have, you know, about 10 minutes or so. You can take that cursor and go back across the video and you'll be able to uh, watch any part of the video now then the, the video will disappear for about an hour or so as YouTube renders it and makes it into a video and then it'll be back up for you to watch again um, up onto our YouTube channel so you can watch it in the future or go back and get it and I know it was a long video sorry about that but I like to do quite a bit of teaching into the class that we're going to do we're going to do a lot of these videos and um, we're going to do a lot of teaching uh, with that but we like to have the ability to go back and watch it again so you'll be able to go back and watch this live broadcast again probably in the in uh, just about an hour or so as they render it all up okay anything else Jay you want to add um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, yeah. I had so much fun chatting with you. you guys yeah, you guys were questions. just uh, you guys were just like chatting away over there. I felt <laughs> a little bit uh, out in the left field here. We're going to have to change some of that. <laughs> I can tell you that. With, but uh, anyway, thanks very much for joining us here. It is oh, it's late here, ten thirty. Got to go get my wife here pretty quick too because she was working and uh, she said she was going to take a break and uh, watch it too. But we'll see if she did. But uh, anyway, thanks very much for joining us here at the Jansen Art Studio. We'll do more of these live broadcasts if you like. Like that would you please go subscribe to our channel now youtube base a lot of their distribution and stuff on the number of subscribers you have so if you like what we're doing and everything just go down and click that you know, take a few moments and click that subscribe for us that would help us out a lot okay and uh you can always look us up also on some of the other social networks and the facebook and stuff like that some of you i talk on facebook all the time so and i'll look forward to seeing you over there and we'll do another one of these live broadcasts real soon i've got to go film some more we got to do some for the bird class starting up monday so some of you have already signed up for the bird class the birds and flowers we're going to be painting roses all different kinds of roses and daisies and bees and butterflies and birds and all different kinds of stuff we start all of that up the classroom opens up on monday nine o'clock in the morning on monday and i'll see some of you over there till next time thanks for joining us here and you have anything else anything else it's all good have a wonderful day. Yes, and uh, we'll see you on some of the other stuff. And you can always click us over onto any of our Facebook pages if you have questions or something like that and uh, and talk to us there, okay? And I'll see you on the next broadcast. <laughs> Thanks very much for uh, for joining us here. I'm gonna, uh, and we'll see you next time, okay? Take care. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. <laughs>